and we're going to, uh, as we normally do, we're going to take a moment of reflection, uh, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. So if you would join us in a moment of reflection, please. Thank you. I'm going to ask if we'll all stand, and I'm going to ask Councilman Harry Collins if he would lead us in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. First thing on the agenda is public hearings, and I don't believe we have any tonight, Randy. Is that correct? <coughs> Very good. Under the consent agenda, we have minutes of the May 9 meeting, the monthly bills, a resolution recognizing Christiansburg High School wrestling team for winning the state, cha state championship for 16 consecutive years, a resolution recognizing Christiansburg High School student Kayla Hatcher for winning the state championship in one meter diving, and a resolution recognizing Christopher High School student Madison Padgett for winning the state champion, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> champion, championship in high jump. No, high jump. We got it right. Oh, okay. We checked that out. It's high pole. <laughs> Move that we approve the consent agenda as presented. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? All right. Aye. 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 Okay, thank you. Uh, I also need to uh, adjust, make an adjustment to the agenda, which I forgot to mention. I would like to move under introductions and presentations, mm -hmm. the presentations and proclamations for the wrestling and for the, the people that we just approved a moment ago. So that will be A1. All right. Citizens' comments. Uh, this is open for any citizen that may want to come and speak on behalf of themselves, for the town. Any questions, comments? Uh, this is a good time to do it. I ask that you. Stand, give us your name, address. You can come to the podium if you'd like, or if your voice carries well, you can stand back at the chairs. Anyone here that would like to address council? Bob? Name is Bob Leonard, representing Christiansburg Institute. And thank you very much for taking, making the time available for us to speak today. We're putting some images on the screen from our architectural reports for the revitalization of the Edgar A. Long Building. These are just to give you a sense of our intentions and the volume of work that has already been accomplished in our effort to revitalize the campus. I'm not going to take a long time uh, making any kind of close examination of these images. You're welcome to ask questions as we go through. What I do want to do is take a moment to thank you for the time that you took in January to get together to hear our history and our vision for the future. It was a thrilling time for us to stand united and unified with the Christenberg Community Center 
to present ourselves as an active coalition with shared vision and goals. Since the summit, we have met with the town administration several times to learn how we might best advance the conversation we began in January. You are now in the midst of drafting a, uh, preparing a draft budget, a task that is unmistakably challenging this particular year. As you take up that challenge, I would like to ask that you accept and consider a revised request for support for Christiansburg Institute Incorporated. It should be noted that our initial request, which we made deadline, was prepared and submitted prior to the summit, and our revisions reflect what we have learned since the summit. When we met with administration over the course of the last couple of months, several months, we were in the process of making this change. That got shorted when the tragedy occurred and we lost our town manager. So this is the best I know how to bring this to your attention. Our request is that you respectfully uh, consider supporting $56,300 in support of re-roofing the Edgar A. Long building. We have engineering and construction reports that verify this figure as our target for a full restoration of the roof. You have them in hand. This action is the initial implementation for revitalizing the Long building and campus. After years of organizational preparation and careful planning, we are taking this vitally important next step towards regaining our property as a center for telling the story of Christiansburg Institute, a proud history of the whole town of Christiansburg, and as a center for advancing that legacy through a multicultural learning and meeting place for the New River Valley and beyond. As part of our preparation for this step, we have successfully formed a strong an active coalition with the Christiansburg Community Center, our sibling organization in the history of Christiansburg Industrial Institute. We have also attracted important new people to our organization to help build strong partnerships in the community and to lead a comprehensive capital campaign for the renovation of the building and the scattered good campus. Unifying the old Hill School with the long building and the scattered good campus sets a strong base on which to develop a historic complex with national impact, as well as significant local value. We look to the town of Christiansburg to join us as our partner in this effort. We envision working with the town over the next year to deepen and expand our planning, our planning based on our mutual interests. In that light, I would like to introduce two men who have joined our effort and would like to have, uh, say a few words. First, Mr. Christopher Sanchez. He has taken fire with this effort as he has learned of our story. Mr. Sanchez. I'm Chris Sanchez, and I represent the Christiansburg Institute. Good evening. Um, I'm honored to address this council and its constituency, the people of the Christiansburg community. I stand before you as a witness to the incomprehensible strength and enduring legacy of the remaining Christiansburg Institute alumni, their descendants, <coughs> and their powerful story. I also stand before you as an advocate committed to honoring that legacy and proclaiming that story, both here in our Christiansburg community the New River Valley, and abroad as opportunities arise. It is the remarkable historical narrative of the Institute, a narrative deeply entrenched and mutually shared with the development of this great town that is most compelling. This narrative must remain central to our vision of restoring the Edgar A. Long building, for it is one of interracial cooperation focused on achieving a shared goal in realizing a shared vision and overcoming extraordinary odds through fellowship and communion across racial lines. It is truly difficult to capture the full scope of the Christiansburg Institute, its robust history, and how this has all influenced me personally. As a young man of color, it has impacted me greatly and provided me with a strong sense of community and connectedness to my African-American heritage. 
I've lived in Chicago, um, Oregon, Michigan, um, and now Virginia. And I can say with confidence and integrity that the story of the Christenberg Institute is a story that needs to be both preserved uh, and proclaimed so folks from communities of color, both in the state of Virginia and abroad, can perhaps find the community and agency I have too found in the history of the Christenberg Institute. Its history powerfully intersects with emancipation, reconstruction, and the formal education of blacks across the New River Valley and beyond. Since the establishment of the Christiansburg Institute Alumni Association, folks have been hard working and dedicated to continuing its story and legacy. Now, from an organizational standpoint, many moving pieces within the Institute have had difficulty gaining cohesion for lack of resources and capacity. Most of the work has been done on a volunteer base. We are now entering, I believe, a new era for the Institute as these moving pieces are now able to and are beginning to concentrate and centralize. I'm a part of that process and am fully committed to its fruition. We live in a time of great division, of great conflict, and of great confusion, particularly in the area of race and race relations. It is my firm conviction that the Christiansburg Institute, in partnership with the town of Christiansburg and the community before us, can cooperatively and collectively utilize the Edgar A. Long building as a space to serve as a pillar of diversity, inclusion, and learning, providing an urgently needed model of reconciliation and equity during these confusing times. May we together imagine and build towards a more just and more equitable and more compassionate society in our future work together. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. You can now well imagine how excited we are to be working with Chris. I'd also like to introduce uh, Mr. Alvin Hughes, whom I know several of you already know. He is joining us coming from his extensive knowledge and practical experience in our community and has committed himself to developing and strengthening our partnerships in a comprehensive fundraising campaign. Mr. Hughes. Good evening. My name is Alvin Hughes, and I'm here with the NAACC. <laughs> I'm getting ready to say the NAACP. Again, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I would first like to start off and thank you, Mr. Mayor, the town council, for giving me this opportunity this evening to speak on the topic of our history. As I hope many of you know, in 1866, Captain Schaefer, Charles Schaefer, United States Army, founded the Christianberg Institute. Known today as the Edgar A. Long Building as part of many missions of the Freedmen's Bureau. An organization established after the Civil War in 1865 to aid freedmen or former slaves in the South, as well as helping found the Institute Captain Schaefer helped build many of the churches, schools, and graveyards from here to Tennessee. Back then, as a white man trying to do this, there were many who tried to stop him, who tried to kill him. As he, as it is said, the fact of the time. This man sacrificed his life to bring education, churches, as well as many other things to the freedmen of the area. And a result of this gained on Booker T. Washington as an advisor to the Institute in 1896. If you have begun to wonder why I am telling you this, it is because the Edgar A. Long Building, as well as Captain Schaefer, is our history. He is the history of 
this valley. It gets me kind of emotional. But I want to let you know, ladies and gentlemen, that his legacy must not die. We all are part of his legacy. As I remember one day, I was cooking for the rescue squad. Mr. Stipes walked up to me and he said, Alvin, one day, hopefully you'll be sketched in stone for the things you do in this community. But I want you to know, I want all of you sketched in stone for what you do for the Edgar Long Building. As some of you may know, the building is currently in a state of despair and are rare to still even exist today since the Klan burned down many of the buildings built by the Freedmen's Bureau. It, are, it is our duty and only to Captain Charles Schaefer and the Eggway Long Building, but to our ancestors and our children to bring the building and Captain Schaefer back to life, we must be able to, to tell and show our children this is a legacy our ancestors left us. It is our history. And I thank y'all for giving me this opportunity to speak. Thank you, Thanks, buddy. Thank you, Mr. Hughes. Just to conclude, we thank you for this opportunity. If there are questions, they are more than welcome. Well, I just wanted to say I wanted to thank you for inviting me to your meeting last, last January. It was uh, very interesting. And uh, at that time, I believe that you uh, said something about some ideas that you were maybe going to try to do uh, in the area of fundraising for this coming summer and coming months. And I was wondering if anything like that had been laid out yet. We are beginning work with uh, Mr. Humes on that very matter. Um, he has made a commitment to work with us um, as he has stepped away from the responsibilities of, of chairing and leading the NAACP local chapter. Uh, I think he's found a little bit, little bit of time and has made that commitment with us. And that's what we're working on. Thank you. Yes, sir. That was one of my questions was Mr. Humes, as he wrapped up, was he, did, was he making a personal commitment to this effort? And I'd like you to, to state so. Is that correct, Mr. Humes? Yes, sir. The, 50, the $56,000 request, is that entirety to, re, to redo the roof? According to the engineering and, and construction reports that you have in hand, those numbers add up to $56,300. And that will get the job done? That's what we believe. Okay. I have, I have a question, the, uh, a couple actually. The, um, figure the 56.3 will be as far as the integrity of the roof yes. and obviously weather out from the top down, if you will. Um, has there been, a, Steve kind of alluded to this a little bit about the fundraising efforts, but have you all centered in on or decided upon a figure in which will be an expectation or, or a goal for the fiscal for this particular year uh, as far as a fundraising effort or? Uh, basically, we're looking at this figure. Yes. We're taking the, the roof as the primary focus for this year, mm -hmm. um, and we will be looking to fund, fund that and our, our ordinary uh, fundraising effort for general operating expenses. What we would like to see, um, what we are anticipating to see, is that we would sit down with town administration and look at the longer picture and develop a plan with the town. Not to say that the town is going to fund it. We're not asking for the town to fund it. We're asking for the town to help us build a plan that would include the town's interest and the town's capacity to help raise funds. If the um, if the roof is um, remediated, frankly replaced at this point, I notice there's a lot of structural pillars and yeah, things yeah, that yeah. also would have to go in yeah. to, again, for as far as an integrity <coughs> situation. Um, are there any other partners that you all have looked at partnering with? And secondly, have you all looked at any type of historical type of grants or any other financial opportunities that may exist? We, the have, federal we have in the past looked at these grants. What, yes. we, what 
what we need to establish is our own capacity and strength at home. I have raised money through grants most of my life. And I know that it is uh, the first order of business to ensure that the home office is functioning and organized. And it's taken us a bit of time to get that in place. That's what we're doing now. And I think that Mr. Hume's and uh, Mr. Sanchez's commitment to this effort is a testimony to our own uh, capacity at this point to move forward. Okay. And lastly, the uh, information provided to us tonight that um, notes that 56-3 figure. Um, how many bids did you all um, receive, and, and how did you decide upon what particular firm to go with for that particular figure? We did not put it to bid. Okay, you just you went to one particular firm? We went to these firms at the advice of... When you uh, said these firms, is there more than one? Or? This uh, uh, Truesdale Engineering and Snyder Contracting. Now, those are the two okay. organizations. Okay, so engineering and then the construction itself. Right, right. Okay. Um, and we went to them uh, with the advice of uh, Dr. David Moore, who was a consultant working for us over the last uh, 18 months, um, about a year ago. Uh, that uh, produced a whole plan on seeking partners. And we put that plan out publicly, um, and we uh, brought that plan to you And uh, at this time last year. Um, and uh, essentially the summit is the result of that plan because you expressed interest in pursuing the question of, rather than just simply funding us, becoming a partner and having a say in how we move forward and having real clarity about how we move forward. Yes, sir. Uh, at that meeting in January, there was a lady, I believe, from Virginia Tech. Yes, sir. And uh, I forget what her position was. She's Associate and, Provost of uh, Diversity and Inclusion. Her name is Dr. Minna Pratt-Clark. That's exactly right, yeah. And I think that she had mentioned that maybe you and, and Tech could be working together mm -hmm. to maybe generate funding or, or whatever. Correct. Have you heard from her? Yes, we have had a meeting with Dr. Pratt Clark. Um, uh, we are uh, we presented the history, and, and she's asked for some particular documents. Um, this is part of uh, our reality. Some of those documents are uh, in the hands of uh, um, Jackie Eve's daughter, uh, Ms. Eve's past, and uh, her estate is still in transfer. Um, so we're waiting to have access to those documents. As soon as we get that, we will be taking those uh, documents to Dr. Pratt-Clark. But what Dr. Pratt-Clark has said to me uh, and to Jesse Eves, we both met with her, uh, that she believes that there is funding sources that Virginia Tech has access to that would be very interested in this project um, and that she would help us, but she needs some documentation which is in process. Any of those identified? Uh, uh, no. Um, she may have said the name to me, but I don't feel at all at liberty to speak to that. One other thing, you have a very nice drawing here. Yes. And you've got some nice work. Do you have any rough idea of uh, approximately how much it would cost to revitalize the whole building? Um, to me. Two point something million. Okay, it, I have a look. No, it's not there. It's not there. It, this is for the roof period. The whole building has been uh, projected at 2.2 million. Okay. Um, that's just the building. What um, in, in conversation with uh, town administrators, um, uh, the reality of, of furnishing the building and preparing it for the pur purposes that we're looking at, we're looking uh, in excess of, of that by several. By a lot of money, um, probably four to five million. Yeah. <coughs> yes, sir. One I left a letter. Yes. I, I'm looking at this. I don't see anything on here uh, with the roof itself. Everything is talking about the trusses, the supports, and all That's that. all in reference to the roof itself. Okay, but that includes the roofing. <coughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's not in here like that, though. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, I, I do. Uh, ever since we met a few months ago, uh, and I, I'm going to refer to it as the coalition uh, yes. community center and the two groups from the Christian and alumni, I, and I know you've spoken with uh, town administration. Little has come out since your meeting, uh, at least from town staff, and it could be, you know, due to the uh, tragedy that happened. But could you 
sort of tell or let me know and counsel what's happened since that because I believe we left it off that you know there, sh there should be a, a, a board a legit board form uh -huh. and, and that's my impression when we left there that night was to, to form a board amongst the coalition members and the town and the county and hopefully Virginia Tech as well one that actually could put a vision together, uh, put plans together, actually borrow money or apply for grants. As, Don't and, say the borrow part. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> but, um, I mean, how is that going? Is it's that, going, it's going pretty well. Um, we, uh, the, the, um, there are three representatives that constitute the, the leading, um, the leadership of the coalition. Uh, Deacon Dave Moore mm -hmm. uh, from the uh, uh, Center. Mm -hmm. um, Catherine King representing the Alumni Association and Latanya Walker representing the Christiansburg <coughs> Institute Incorporated. And they, along with other uh, folks who are very interested in this, meet monthly. Um, uh, so we've met February, March, April, uh, met, we've met four times. Um, we've been assigning uh, specific committees to move forward on various aspects of it. Uh, public relations, budgeting, um, common vision, um, all these things take the time that they take to lay that out. But we are definitely on the move with that. Are you keeping minutes of these meetings? Or yes. Some, okay, so. The two men who were with you by that night, are they still involved with the organization? Are yes. they still working for you? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, yes. Just Bob, speaking to your uh, information you provide us this evening, and I certainly appreciate you and, and, and the um, other folks that you brought to support this. Um, the proposals are somewhat dated. The, uh, they are. Is Truesdale still alive, what I would call a live proposal? Is he still willing to be? Um, I have not tested that. Here's what, here's what ha happened. Uh, under, with the leadership that we got from uh, Dr. Dave Moore from uh, uh, our consultant, not to be confused with Deacon Dave Moore. Uh, right. That's confusing for me. Um, uh, the, the proposals came forward with the caveat that more research needs to get done. Um, and you'll see that the, the last item, the most recent dated item, January of 2016, uh, from Truesdale, says that it would cost us in the vicinity of $5,500 or something like that to move forward to get the actual construction uh, plan um, to hand over to the construction folks. And in the course of that, they don't know what they might find. And we felt that it was premature, not knowing where the $50,000 was going to come from, it was premature to take that next step. As you say, these are dated documents in two years. So we don't know what we might find when we make those, when we make that commitment of dollars to uh, proceed. So I guess the question is based on the fact that if council wants to support this, there's obviously an expectation that certain things will be accomplished as a result of That's that. That's right. And the first That's thing we would do is it. move forward with, with uh, uh, Truesdale. And his fees are reasonable. I mean, the fees proposed are reasonable based you know, based on yes. comparison to the work. In fact, probably half of what I would expect to see for right. design and construction. Right. But anyway, so I'll just throw that out there. I mean, you're requesting us to take a formal action. Yes. And we would, I think, well, this, I'll speak for myself, if we were to take favorable action, we would like, some, we would like to have some level of assurance or expectation yes, sir. that the money has been you know, accomplished what That's it's right. intended to accomplish. That's right. And, and we would be happy to work with you step by step along the way. Um, that's what we imagine as a partnership. Um, you're, if you were to make this choice, you would be saying we are with you and we would turn to you and let you know exactly what's going on step by step through whatever mechanism in administration might be appropriate. All right. Any other questions, comments? Thank you all very much. Not, not to get redundant here, but the 56000 that that is the total cost of this, is that correct? That, according to the documents you have, is their best estimate under the circumstances. And it will require a final construction review, I mean, engineering review, to bring it up to date, and we will move forward on that. Now, are you expecting this whole, us to pay the whole 56000 or do you 
Does your concern have any money to add to the We would love for you to take the whole bill. Uh, everybody in this room would, would anticipate that that would be terrific. If you cannot afford that, we are certainly committed to working to find the funds to make this happen. We are not giving up by any stretch of the imagination. We are moving forward. It is possible that it would cost more than that. We are committed to making the money difference if it were to cost more than that. Mr. Leonard, what are your current administrative fees on a yearly basis? For Operating the costs? Yes. Um, we have fixed uh, costs at about $10,000. Um, we have uh, uh, programmatic costs that are uh, based on available funds. Um, they come in around uh, $5,000. And we have um, the uh, intention to begin to move from an all-volunteer uh, organization to a professionally uh, staffed organization and we are making an effort step by step to move in that direction. Um, we are making contracts uh, within our available resources to uh, do that step by step, quarter as it were by quarter. Um, right now in our current budget, if we were successful at raising all the money that we intend to raise, we are looking at having about $36,000 to move in that direction. As personnel. Well, I, I, I went through a quick glance of this thing and of the estimates, and I honestly do not see anything here that strikes me as a permanent roof. You're doing all of the support work, yeah. you get it done, but I don't see anything that's going to protect it once you get it you done. You mean the sheathing on the top? The shingle. Yeah, the, the roof shingle itself. is whatever it is. Is that? I mean, I, I, I'm just saying you may want to double check. With I your will man definitely see. double check on that. But I don't see anything that's going to protect the work once it's done. Well, we, we're certainly going to protect the work that's going to get done. We're, we're going to put shingles on it. Okay. Um, the, the reality is, as a historic site, um, that can be expensive. And uh, quite frankly, um, uh, we've, we, we've been told that we can get artificial. It's supposed to look like sleep, um, but it doesn't have to be sleep. Um, we can get artificial uh, materials for a slate color. Okay. I just want to recall that to your attention. Absolutely. That, that, that we will work out with you and let and you know what's going on. The I, next I, step is the next step. That's what you were talking about. I would think if 56000 is going to cover the whole thing, you probably ought to jump on it pretty, pretty quick, but I think you're going to, you're going to find a significant additional cost right, so yes. for that roof. Yes, sir. Okay. okay. Anything else? Go yes, ahead, sir. Uh, one more question, please, sir. Uh, or do you have an accounting of the money that the town has already let you have in years past? Yes. And can we get a copy of that? Uh, you have. Uh, when Mr. Bishop first got on, he asked for three years back, mm -hmm. and I provided that. So however many years back that is, and we have an end-of-year uh, uh, statement, and we've made available to you, I think in this, in this uh, submission, um, on the official one, our 990. And uh, you would have 990s from the way back. And if you have any missing, I'd be happy to get them for you. Uh, yeah, will you please? Because I wasn't here when he started. Yeah, yeah. Well, we, did we have that in the in the request, so we have that on file some morning. Okay. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Bob, I, I hate to tell you, you used more than your three minutes, but that's okay. <laughs> I want to thank you very much. <laughs> We're good right now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else here to address council? Seeing or hearing no one, I will close the citizens' comments section. We will move to introductions and presentations. And Ms. Powell? Do you, do you want to do the resolutions first? No, we'll do that second. We got it. I got this. <laughs> certificates tonight to present first um, to two young women who are here who were selected to participate in and successfully completed the House of Delegates PAGE program. Um, and so I'll just read a, a, a subsection of the certificate here. It says that serving as a PAGE is an honor and through your work you exemplify dedication, commitment, and integrity. Thank you for positively representing our town and working to make a difference in your community. And I'd like to invite Meredith Delia and Caleb Lovins up, um, and the mayor is going to present you with this certificate. And I'll grab a photo if that's all right. <laughs> 
Congratulations. I know that you served a couple of years ago, yes. right? But uh, we apologize for not bringing you forward sooner. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, photo ops, parents, <laughs> invited guests and friends. Scoop, you got your camera going? So, I want both of you to tell me everything you learned about me. <laughs> no. I mean, how, I mean how, was, how was the experience? I mean, how, what did you base it? Successful? Um, it was very educational. It helped me with leadership for sure. And since um, I'm going to be a senior next year, it helped me decide what I would like to major in, like mm. political science, okay. when I go off to college. Very good. Yeah, it was a... I get, your, I get your mother to <laughs> <laughs> um, It was just a fun experience because I got to meet and work with everyone there in first-hand experience for legislation. Very good. Ladies and gentlemen, our pages. <laughs> Great job. I'll let you handle them and see the photos. You're doing the photos, okay. I'm going to get this back around this way. This ain't even on. Can, can oh, very good. It's unusual. Good job, guys. Uh, we have a couple of individual recognitions tonight. Uh, the first is a resolution in recognition of Caleb Hatcher's state title. Whereas Caleb Hatcher, who just completed his freshman year at Christiansburg High School, won the state 3A championship in one meter diving on February 16, 2017 at the Christiansburg Aquatic Center. And whereas Caleb Hatcher has an had an outstanding season and worked hard to conquer, conquer difficult dives, and whereas Caleb Hatcher brought favorable recognition to Christiansburg High School, the town of Christiansburg, and the larger community through his dedication and success. And whereas the Christiansburg Athletic Aquatic Center is proud to serve as the home pool for the Christiansburg High School swimming and diving teams, it is excited to watch Caleb Hatcher grow, continue to grow in the sport and compete in future events. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Council of the Town of Christiansburg hereby expresses its congratulations and appreciation to Caleb Hatcher for his continued outstanding performance, and we extend our best wishes for continued success. Upon an I, a call for an I vote or nay vote, the following resolution is regular town council meeting, Christopher Town Council, held May 23rd, 2017. Members uh, stood opposite the votes on this indication. Caleb? You're no cross country guy, aren't you? <laughs> Alright, Scoop wants a picture. Thank you. And your dad wants a picture. I understand that you're training with Piemontes, uh, Ron and Tina, Tina. Tina and Ronnie. Is that right? That's good. So uh, And Leah. And Leah, of course, and Leah. So it's 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 a big honor, but you understand you're you're maybe you're not as experienced in diving as you were in the cross country. Is that right? Yes. You just took it up on the wheel. Yeah. Yeah, oh, it's pretty good. Not bad. Not bad. So uh, congratulations again. Uh, we we appreciate all that you do and, and the honor that you bring to the table. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Madison Padgett, are we here tonight? We're not making it. Okay, we have the same resolution honoring Madison. I will see that she gets this. And uh, Marty, wherever he took off, we'll, I'll, I'll make sure that he gets some pictures for us. So, uh, she won the state 3A high jump championship in the indoor track season this year. So uh, we will congratulate her, congratulate her maybe at a future meeting. Thank you. I'm now going to ask uh, Councilman Cord Hall if he will come forward 
and present a resolution uh, since he is a former wrestler. Is that what we call it? Right? I'm Are not you? a former wrestler. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you count the professional Someone asked Mr. Carl if he would take this, this one for me. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Coach Close, if I can have you and uh, the members of the <laughs> come forward. Good to see you again. Mm -hmm. This has become a uh, common occurrence. Uh, and again, not to cheapen it whatsoever, but it's, again, I think every year I talk about the expectation. And it's year to year the expectation, and, and the bar is set increasingly high. And once again, here we are celebrating the exact same accomplishment, the same feat which once again is even more unprecedented than it was the year before. So uh, I believe I heard uh, Tony Dibler speak about it at the graduation again uh, this past uh, uh, I think it was Sunday and mentioned this feat as well. This is again unprecedented and unknown, frankly, uh, throughout sports is my understanding. Um, so with that being said, this is a resolution and recognition of the Christianburg High School wrestling team. It says, whereas the Christianburg High School wrestling team has once again been victorious, winning the Virginia High School League Group 3A state championship, on February the 18th, 2017 in Salem, Virginia, and whereas the Christianburg wrestling team has sustained a record of winning the state championship, having won for the years, and I'm not going to do through, but we're going to list these, 2002, 2003, 2004, 2005, 2006, 2007, 2008, 2009, 2010, 2011, 2012, 2013, 2014, 2015, 2016, and now 2017. And whereas, in a true team effort, the Christiansburg High School Blue Demons accumulated 204 points this year to win the state championship, out distancing the runner up by 65 points. And whereas, team member Hunter Bolin, who finished the season with a 37 and 1 record, won an individual state championship in the 160-pound division after a 17-2 technical fall victory <coughs> in the state. And whereas this record of accomplishment in winning the state championship for 16, for 16, okay, sorry, 16 <laughs> consecutive see, uh, years has brought, it says favorable, it's brought an Im immeasurable recognition to the town of Christiansburg, uh, its coaches, its wrestling team members, and the community as a whole. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Council of the Town of Christenberg hereby expresses its congratulations and appreciation to Coach Sonny Close and all members of the Christenberg High School wrestling team for their continued outstanding performance in the Virginia State 3A Wrestling Championships, and we extend our best wishes for continued success. This was on a, nay, on a yay or nay vote, was unanimous by the Town Council and the Mayor as well. We greatly appreciate everything and all the positive, rec positive recognition you bring to the town. And having been to practices in the past, just kind of sitting in and looking in, I know what daily you all go through. This is not simply something where you show up once in a while and go through the motions. You don't get 16 consecutive state championships by going through the motions. You are, frankly, the uh, exemplary professionals, in my opinion, at the high school level. Thank you very much. And I, again, I, Coach Close, all my appreciation. Thank you very Guys, much. Could you get in a little bit closer and forward? Yeah. If he wouldn't mind, there's a certificate we also have for Hunter Bowling. I think it's best coming from him as the coach to, to Hunter. Right. <laughs> no move, we got plenty of cameras behind Just real quick, right here. What's up? I guess the question I have, Thank you. Yeah. how many of you young men we were born when they won the first title? <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. How many of you are under 17 years of age? There you go. Very good. Very good. That's pretty impressive. Very impressive. Yeah. impressive. Yeah. Gentlemen, thank you very much. And before we say, Coach Close, again, you've got the audience. You're on videos or anything. You want to you like? introduce your guys? Please. And, and anything right. you'd like to say. Uh, this is my assistant coach, Devin Bizaha. Um, he helps out a lot. <laughs> Josh Linkus, state runner-up. Uh, this is Patrick Farrell. This is Andy Smith. This is uh, Xander Whitehurst, state runner-up. 
This is Marshall Keller, the state champion. This is Nick Giantonio, the state champion. And as you know, this is Hunter Bowling, who's also a state champion. But uh, they were in previous years, so um, it's not this year. Uh, there you go. Where's everybody? Very good. Hey, guys. Thank you. Well, you've heard, I'm sure, that we're going to have, a, have some kind of parade for you. And it got held off because the school, you know, wanted to get their stuff done for it this year. But I talked with the principal this morning, the athletic director, and I'm going to get with the uh, club, you know, that helps you guys. <coughs> and, we're, and we will have a parade for you guys this year. And uh, Sheila has already said that we could have all the trucks we want. Would you guys rather ride in the truck? <laughs> just for the parade. Just for the parade. Yeah. 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 And we'll have a good parade downtown. If we, have, if we have one unit for each state championship, it may be longer than the Christmas Well, parade. you're right. That's, <laughs> that's a good thing, guys. And we're going to try to get people from all 16 years in it also. So, yeah, please let them know. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you all very much. Any further, I'm going to take about a two or three minute break so that those of you in the audience can, if you would like to congratulate these young men and women for their accomplishments, let's just we'll take a couple of minutes. And, uh, Mr. Barron, I could before we do that. I just uh, one of the things that's so good about winning these 16 years, so many Christian Bear wrestlers have gone on to wrestle in college, and uh, I mean, if anybody followed Virginia Tech. Some of their best wrestlers, uh, you know, have won uh, championships for the whole country. And I know several of you guys will probably be going. I know Farron has got some great wrestlers from Christiansburg. And I think that's such a great deal, you know, spreading Christiansburg around, around the state and around the country about what a great program we have here. And I congratulate all of you and, and wish all of you the best of luck as you move on. Hey, Stephen, let me take that one step further before we take this three-minute three break. I'm very blessed in my employment to be able to go into a lot of area high schools. I pretty much live in the schools, and I go to schools inside and outside of the Commonwealth of Virginia. You would be surprised. Uh, I always walk in the gym when I go to a school almost always. I like to always look at the banners. I like to always look at the walls. And you would be surprised the amount of schools in and outside the Commonwealth of Virginia that recognize immediately the name Christiansburg when it's mentioned as a wrestling, not just powerhouse, but again, the epitome of success mm -hmm. at high school athletics. Um, it happens more times than not. And it doesn't matter where I'm at, the most rural or the most uh, uh, urban of, of schools, they recognize the excellence that comes from the town of Christiansburg. And you're one of the reasons for it. For that, I thank you. Take about three minutes, three or four minutes. <laughs> All right, uh, I will call the meeting back into session, and we have introduction of a new employee. Melissa Powell, would you like to handle this for me? Is she still here? Oh, yes, she is. is. <laughs> Sorry, All right, I think some of you may have come by tomorrow and met Anika, but um, this is Anika Miller. She is the new public relations specialist. Uh, I have a little blurb about her. I'm mainly going to read because I didn't have time to look at it before. But Anika grew up in Southern California and moved to Christiansburg in September after graduating from UCLA with a bachelor's degree in political science in June of 2016. She has a background in both public relations and journalism, having served as um, an external relations assistant in UCLA's Graduate School of Education for several years before coming, becoming the community news editor for the News Messenger and Radford News Journal. She's thrilled to have the opportunity to continue working in communications for the town of Christiansburg, which already feels like home to her, and she's especially fallen in love with the area's natural beauty and proximity to a seemingly endless number of hiking trails. She enjoys rock climbing, running, and of course swimming at the Christiansburg Aquatic Center. 
she likes to cook, and she may be currently relearning how to play the violin. So, <laughs> we're very glad to have her. <laughs> I have to ask more questions. Yes. Uh, what brought you here from Los Angeles? That's a good one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Let's start with the story. Um, yeah, so uh, my boyfriend actually is working for Virginia Tech. Uh, I must say it, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. so he out and I decided to come with him. We're glad to have you. I'm very happy to be here, yeah. And you're a Hokie now. Yes. <laughs> is that yeah, reluctant? No, no more Bruin gear. <laughs> okay. Any other questions or comments? I have had the opportunity to work very uh, fairly closely with uh, a NICA. <clears throat> Uh, Nika. It's different than it's, than it, than it's spelled, but it is. I, it took me all, she gave me a pronunciation and I keep on the corner of my desk. <laughs> it's not I, working, right? It, it's getting there. I was, at first I thought I was just going to have to call her Nike, but we finally got it all burned away. <laughs> but she, is, she does a really, really good job. Uh, I've, I've watched some of the things that she's done and, and, and uh, we have a really good one-two punch again in public relations. We have two people Yes. And Nike, are you are you also from Southern California originally? Originally, yes. Mm. A little bit north. Is this your first time in Virginia when you moved here? This was, yeah. Wow. We're glad you're here. It wasn't a culture shock, was it? <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I, everyone said that. Yeah, I, I really like it here. So. Uh, what's not, your favorite? Not a bad culture shock. <laughs> if you could pick one thing about Christiansburg that you like, what is it? <laughs> well, one, one thing I like is like my favorite question. thing. <laughs> that's, that's, yeah, um, but. I, so I think I really like yeah. the sense of community because I came from Los Angeles. And it's, okay. just, it's just difficult to yeah. you know, connect with people. It's just a huge city. So I really like that. Good. Very good. Welcome aboard. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> Old business. We have council action on conditional use permit request by ETR Investments for a game room in the B3 General Business District at 77 Scatter Good Drive Northwest, tax number 496-20-4. The public hearing was held on, March, on May the 9th, 2017. And I move that we approve. Okay. A motion and a second. Madam Clerk, I will test you. Will you call the roll? I will. Um, Councilman Bishop? Aye. Councilman Collins? Aye. Councilman Hall? Aye. Councilman Huppert? Aye. Councilman Showalter? Aye. And Councilman Sykes? Aye. Well, 6 -0. Thank you very much, Eddie. Congratulations. Thank Look you. for big things over there. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> Under our new business, we have uh, the adoption of emergency operation plan and EOP, and I think there is a resolution that we have to do yearly. Is that correct? And it basically states that we do have a plan, we do have a director, and we do have a coordinator. The director is the town manager. The coordinator is Chief Hanks. They're correct with the fire department, and it. <clears throat> I can't see it now. But anyway, that's kind of what we have. We need, a, we need a, oh, you got it right there. You did it? No, I'm good. I mean, it just makes, it just states that we are in compliance as, as normal. Mr. Wingfield, would you like to add anything to that? No, that's uh, basically yes. Well, it's, that a, I, it's an annual thing. Well, then I, I believe it uh, on a, as a vote, I guess it's necessary. I'd move that we approve of the emergency operations plan as presented in the agenda packet. I so, second. A motion and a second. Any discussion? Is this the uh, is this the plan that Mr. Delaney's involved with? It is. It right. is. It's right. Delaney. That's right. The only the only changes in the plan were name changes from you know the last plan we approved had Mr. Helms's name on, and had the old uh, the police station dispatch center in it, and we had to update it to the new regional 911 authority, and then change the names in the plan. But the plan plan is basically the same plan that we've had in place, just a few minor changes. And, and it's name changes and location changes. It's all so. <coughs> nothing substantive, just correct. More, okay, correct. All right, we have that motion in second. Madam Clerk, Councilman Bishop, aye. Councilman Collins, aye. Councilman Hall, aye. Councilman Huppert, aye. Councilman Showalter, aye. Councilman Stikes, aye. That is six zero. And also, let me just take a second to welcome Amber Haskins. Uh, to us. Uh, Thank she's you. Feeling, she's pinch hitting tonight for, 
Ms. Stipes, I think Brad just in the family more out on vacation. Well, it's it slightly more to it than that. Yeah, we got back after 6 p.m. And, and there's some other factors. But okay. We appreciate Amber. Anytime. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Uh, items for consideration from the engineering department present to be presented by Director Wayne Nelson. Church at Rigby. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of council. First agreement in front of you is a uh, revised appendix A2 and B5 of a VDOT agreement for the Church Rigby Ellet Storm Drain Project. VDOT identified additional funds in the amount of 403000 excuse me, $426 that to be applied to this project. And we did so to hedge against uh, potential rock that we'll encounter, might encounter, also to extend the project from uh, from Cambridge Street on up Ellet to uh, King Street. So the uh, request of council is to approve of this uh, revised agreement, Appendix A2, uh, for this project. Can I ask a question? May I ask a question, Mayor? Certainly. And I'll put you on the spot, Mr. Nelson, because you, you know good. how much I appreciate personally what you do. Uh, but is this your idea to bring these, like a contract like this, before council, or is it is it the previous town manager, or or can I be just blunt? <clears throat> it's, it's the previous. Okay. Yeah. I, I trust you intrinsically, and I'm an engineer, okay? I understand about half of what I'm reading here. But I have complete faith and confidence in you and your ability to administer contracts. And I think I think what we're looking at here, which <clears throat> the next one's a good one, a pressure reducing valve. I'd, I'd like to know, with the exception of Jim Lansonese, if there's anyone in this room that knows what a pressure reducing valve is. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. But my point is simple. My point is simple. We pre I appreciate what you do, and I'm not sure that this is something council needs to be doing, is looking at in individual contracts for stuff we have no clue what the guts of it are. We get updates from you occasionally about what all the projects are going on. Sure. But I'm gonna support I'm gonna support your recommendation on all five of these, I'll tell you right now. But in the future, for council's consideration, I don't think we need to be looking at contracts internally on projects that we've got capable staff to oversee. Well, I appreciate that. That's just one person. They're funded, right? Yeah, they this are. This isn't a special funding where we're making an amendment or Anything of that nature. We've already agreed to yeah. on the contract in these terms. I, I can support um, Brad on, on this. I think that's a very good point. And I mean, I, you know, our meetings you know, are getting longer and longer. That's where we pay the three bucks, too, you know? <laughs> to be quite honest, uh, this is the tip of the iceberg. We're just getting started. Mm -hmm. this, these projects are going to start. Well, rolling along here. I give that to council to consider, but in the future, I don't think we need to be in the, in the, in the Inside of the whale here, trying to figure out whether a rib is discolored or something. I think, yeah, I mean, in, in years past, the, the times in which I felt like it, well, it just really hasn't been a lot of these in years past, but recently, it's when there's been a, a, either a design change, obviously, which would, would could perhaps change the, the, uh, the uh, uh, color, if you will, of the contract in and of itself. But again, Brad, you just mentioned what's a pressure reducing valve. Our first person I looked at was Jim. I have no <laughs> clue what that is. I know it goes to the point in the water line, but right, I mean, well, really, what do we need to know about this? But, but I mean, the only benefit I see is that I mean, when you talk about it on camera, then again, we've already approved of these particular contracts. We've already had a a vote initially on the contract. So. True. And True. So, so I know it's public wouldn't be losing anything because they've already heard the discussion on the initial contract. Yeah, we have updates on That's right. Updates on the yes. Yes. projects are in the approved budget. That's right. Uh, Teresa, I think you want to like one of these. Yes. Um, technically, contracts have to be approved by council. Mm -hmm. Um, but we could put them on the consent agenda, and that way we wouldn't have, unless there's something that the council wants to pull out for greater discussion. Okay, yeah. Um, but um, basically, what all you really need to, because the form will be approved by, by me, but all you really need to approve is the contractor, the amount, and the project, so you know what we're contracting for. The other alternative is to give. Um, Randy the authority to sign off on contracts up to a certain amount and I could put something together 
So anything under a certain amount can be handled administratively, but anything large. I would rather. Have Did we do this in the past? I mean, we. I mean, the consent agenda. That's something new. And it wasn't done historically, and it was something that I brought up with a former town manager, but it wasn't changed. But technically, uh, the only, you know, in order to be able to execute a contract, you have to be delegated the authority from council. So you either delegate the authority to sign up to a certain amount or, you know, create an ordinance where, you know, you can sign to a certain amount and then certain things come to you or... Or, but, or approve them in consent. Yeah, but, in, but technically, in order for a, count, a, a contract to be valid, it needs to be approved. By yeah. the Me personally, I, I'd, I'd feel better with it. And, and, and don't take offense to this, yeah. Mr. Wingfield, at all. I'd feel better if, it, if, it's, if we're going to do it in a short version, we do it on the consent agenda. Absolutely. That way it's part of the agenda packet, and that way the, the, uh, the citizens can see it. And if we have a question, we can then bring it up. Just always see the flow of information. Right, I, first, if I have a question about what's a pressure-reducing valve, I can still bring that up. But, um, but I, I do think having in the packet, there's transparency there. And that's what we're looking for ultimately. So, But I do agree with Brad. I, I mean, I, I like hearing about it. Is precious here. You like hearing about it? No, no, I love hearing about it. I like hearing from Mr. Nelson because, again, I, I hold him in a very similar you state as Mr. Brad does. You know. but, but then again, I think some of this is wasted on me a little bit as far as the engineering aspects. Frankly, I was periodically the 3 plus 1 even what you're doing on how it's going along. We, that, that, that be good. Yeah. we spent a little time discussing this. Yeah. We have. We have. We have. We have. Yeah. Future meetings. Yeah. Yeah. We'll be better off. Yeah. Yeah. I was yeah. really looking forward to finding out what Yeah. Right. Well, we're going to find out. We're going to find out. Well, uh, so if, if, it's, if it's councils. Can we amend uh, the agenda? Put, the, put whatever we can. I, I would Fresh think that if you would like to listen briefly to all five and approve all five in one motion. That might help us out a little bit. Madam Attorney, is that good? Well, you're spending money. A contract, you're spending funds. It should be a roll call. We'd have a single yeah, vote. Yeah, I mean, you can do it. Um, you know, it, and that brings up, if it's on the consent agenda, right. as long as you do it by a roll call vote. But you're authorizing them to spend. I know you have money that's appropriated mm -hmm. for capital improvement projects, but here is where you're actually, you know, you're getting the number amount, the contract. That's where we're going the, the on the record for authorizing it, yeah. right? Okay. So, do we want to uh, do these individually? I, th I think we, we ought to do it this time. Right. So, Very yeah, good. Until then, yeah. uh, do I hear a motion to approve number one? I would move that we approve the um, uh, no. uh, revised appendix A2 as presented. Um, Church Rigby? Yeah, wait. I would, I would move that we approve the Church Rigby Ellis Storm Drainage Project as presented. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, Madam Clerk. Uh, Councilman Bishop? Aye. Councilman Collins? Aye. Councilman Hall? Aye. Councilman Hubbard? Aye. Councilman Showalter? Aye. Councilman Stites? Aye. Aye. All right. That is 6 0. Uh, next on the list is pressure reducing valve installation, and we're <laughs> on the edge of our chairs. <laughs> In one sentence or less, yeah. <laughs> the uh, so con concrete tanks are in <clears throat> state of disrepair. And the pressure reducing valves allow the allow that the customers served by those tanks to be served by a tank that's at a higher elevation. It reduces the pressure so the customers don't see a change in the water pressure when they turn the spigot on, or the pressure does not exceed what the health department regulates as the maximum. Okay. That installation is approximately forty thousand dollars, Mr. Nelson. Well, the the budget is seventy five thousand. We uh, under small purchase. We solicited bids from five contractors. We got this one, and with this contract and material cost, we will be right at budget. Move that we approve the pressure reducing valve installation contract as presented. Second. Motion to second. Any discussion? Hearing none, Madam Clerk. Uh, Councilman Bishop. Aye. Councilman Collins. Aye. Councilman Hall. Aye. Councilman Hubbard. Aye. Councilman Showalter. Aye. Councilman Sykes. Aye. This is 6 -0. Thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, downtown drainage improvements, North Franklin Street, project engineering design contract. This is a 
design contract with D&D Incorporated for the downtown Mill Franklin drainage improvements. They addresses flooding on the east side of Mill Franklin, uh, spe specifically 103, 107, and 111 Mill Franklin Street. And this is a revenue sharing project. Uh, we will uh, get this project initiated this year. Very good. Make a recommendation. We approve the contract as presented. Second. Uh, motion on the second. Any discussion? Hearing none, Madam Clerk. Uh, Councilman Bishop. Aye. Uh, Councilman Collins. Aye. Councilman Hall. Aye. Councilman Huppert. Aye. Councilman Showalter. Aye. Councilman Sykes. Aye. Long term water and wastewater extension planning project contract. This is a engineering study for the <clears throat> exit 114 area within our inside and outside our established water and sewer boundary agreement with PSA. Uh, the, this is in conjunction with the Exit 114 bridge replacement project where we have requested a VDOT to place casing pipes under the bridge so we can extend our utilities out Route 8 uh, within our service area <coughs> at a minimum. And it certainly does support growth in, in that area at that at that interchange of the interstate. And this was with CHA Consulting Incorporated. Okay. Is VDOT putting those condos in? I haven't seen the plans yet, but yeah. my understanding is yes. So we would pay we would just pay the cost for the betterment of the yeah, that is my understanding as well. It sounds really good, yeah. <clears throat> Do I have a motion? So we second. Motion of the second. Any questions? Uh, Councilman Bishop. Uh, Councilman Collins. Aye. Councilman Hall. Aye. Councilman Huppert. Aye. Councilman Showalter. Aye. Councilman Stipes. Aye. Very good. And last, North Franklin Independence Intersection Improvement Project Notice of Award. Uh, notice of Award and a request to enter into a contract with DCI Shires. We bid the project. Uh, they were low bidder. This improves the intersection, the turn lane, uh, provides for pedestrian signal accommodations at the Independence and Mill Franklin intersection. Uh, and some drainage improvements and turn lane improvements, both turning onto Mill Franklin from Independence, uh, headed south, excuse me, north. And uh, also uh, on North Franklin Street, we are turning onto Independence to go west. So, Mr. Nelson, this will not interfere. This won't have to be reconstructed with our upcoming project, the uh, North Franklin Corridor. Correct. Uh, won't have to this be tearing out currently down here. And so no, forth. this has been coordinated. Okay. Uh, our our uh, corridor project will tie right into this. It's a revenue sharing project, which will begin within the next two weeks, we believe, to now that school is out, uh, we want to be at substantial by 1st of August before school starts again. You're saying this will, will start, this project will start within the next two weeks? Yes. So we'll have a PR campaign, campaign beginning here very soon. That's great. All right. Thank you. Any questions? Any further questions? I do have a question, Mr. Nelson. The, uh, uh, Brad mentioned the corridor project tie-in. Um, obviously, that's something on our radar. To make sure we don't you know, have to undo any work that we've done. But one thing that's been missing up there, of course, is any type of uh, pedestrian accommodation, especially with our kids that are coming across that rather busy intersection there. Um, but uh, I have a question about the Huckleberry Trail tie-in or potential tra trail tie-in. Because that's one of the next phases would be coming down in front of the school and basically meandering its way, if you will. Um, does that take into consideration where that would tie in, or how does that all fit together? It, it does. Uh, that's coordinated as well with the corridor project. Uh, that's a federally funded project, and this will be be completed before that. And mm -hmm. 
Uh, the same engineer has designed that project, and so that's coordinated. Okay. So we have some continuity between the with, with the engineer. There is. Okay. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Motion and second. Any discussion? Further discussion? Madam Clerk? Uh, Councilman Bishop? Aye. Councilman Collins? Aye. Councilman Hall? Aye. Councilman Huppert? Aye. Councilman Showalter? Aye. Councilman Sykes? Aye. Very good. Thank you. And we'll work on the, getting this a little smoother next time. Uh, that concludes the new business that we have on the agenda. Our next is committee reports. <coughs> Do we have any committee reports tonight from any of the... No, uh, we've had a water and sewer committee meeting on regards to, and also solid waste. Um, Mrs. Alderman, who had made a request and actually has asked to not pursue smoke testing on the property. I'll just pass that along to water and sewer mm -hmm. solid waste committee. Um, is, let me ask a quick question on that, Mr. Wingfield. Uh, and I have Jim Sears well and I should see everybody here that's pretty much at the meeting. Um, my understanding, and that's certainly her right to do that, and we were trying to help, but my understanding is that means there is no other alternative. That would have been our last resort, correct? That's correct. And, and so at this point in time, <clears throat> may I ask what the posture is as far as her? She said uh, that she would cover any cost herself if there were any sewer so backups. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Very good. Thank you very much. And thank you all for all the work and, and hard work that you all put in for it and, and trying to educate Henry and I. Thank you. Okay. Uh, staff reports, town manager. I'd like to set a public hearing for a minute to the sewer use ordinance for June 27th, if that's acceptable. Amendment to the sewer use? Yes. So moved. June 27th. Second. Motion is second. Any yeah. discussion other than we have a public hearing that night on signage? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Also, I'd like to point out uh, Christiansburg Rescue has won the American Heart Association Mission Lifelines Gold Plus EMS Recognition Award. That's the highest award you can receive from them. Last year, we had received the silver award. That's great, Joe. Uh, yeah. That's all I have. Okay, do we need to vote on the public hearing? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Uh, <coughs> do I have a motion to approve the request for a public hearing for uh, amendment of water for the sewer usage? We've got a, we've already got a motion in a second. We've got a motion in a second. Mm -hmm. Uh, Councilman Bishop? Aye. Councilman Collins? Aye. Councilman Hall? Aye. Councilman Hubbard? Aye. Councilman Showalter? Aye. Councilman Stites? Aye. Very good. 6 0. Madam Attorney? Aye. <coughs> you have nothing? Uh, other staff, Finance Director or Treasurer about 20 to present a draft annual budget for fiscal year 2017 2018. You all have hard copies in front of you that we printed out for you. There also um, there is a PDF version of it up on the website as of this evening, I think, Melissa. Excellent. Okay. Um, so it is up on the website. I usually don't post it until it's been presented to you. So um, that is up there. And look at that clicker. Oh, Looking at it, huh? Just kidding. I heard we go. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Is it all? Yeah. Okay. So what um, I thought we'd do tonight is um, just kind of take a quick look through the budget document. 
Um, go through how it's laid out to help you read through it and understand it. Talk about the highlights of the budget. Um, you also all filled out a questionnaire, so we'll address some of the things that were addressed in the questionnaire. We'll talk about what some of the primary changes are, the revenues and expenditures, as well as staffing, capital projects. Um, Wayne's going to talk about our capital projects that are presented in the budget. We're also going to have a presentation from Chief Sisson, Chief Coyle, and from Jim Lansonese on Public Works. These are the areas that are um, <coughs> the largest parts of our budget. Um, so we thought that it would be good to have them each present for just a few minutes um, some of the high points of the budget that they all have and that are an integral part of, of what you're looking at tonight. And then we'll finish up with just taking um, a look at the assumptions in the five-year forecast. And we'll be done. Probably take a little longer than we hope. <laughs> Um, the proposed budget is based on a number of meetings with directors, um, staff, in reviewing all of their information. They submitted their documentation in stages um, with expectations to expend and all their capital needs. There was an extensive capital request process for everything in their um, capital items. Spent a lot of time going through those and a lot of time putting together um, the CIP. Um, so this is our best effort to present you with a budget that we feel will sustain our level of growth and the customer service within the constraints of the funds that we have available and the priorities that have been set forth in Destination 2022. Um, so after a lot of review and trouble and toil, um, additions and deletions were made to budgets and we now have uh, this draft to present to you this evening. Um, the questionnaire, you're going to see that we've addressed a lot of the things in the questionnaire throughout the presentation later this evening, but a couple of items that you won't specifically see addressed but that I wanted to let you know that we are still working on. Um, there was a question about moving forward with economic development and revolving funds and <clears throat> helping businesses and all of those items. And this is an item that we would like to shift to, but currently um, the funding for that is with the Community Development Block Grant Funds, or CDBG. Um, those funds are currently tied up in the Park Street project, and that's what they have been committed to for the funding levels that we have. But what we'd like to do is, once we have completed that project and look at our long-term plans there, is maybe shift the funding that we get from CDBG to looking at some of the economic development and revolving loan that funding that we can use CDBG funding for. Um, the other is merchant service fees. There was some discussion about changing the structure in which we do that. Um, once we get through budget this year, we are going to put out an RFP to look at those, and we'll come back to you with some information about shifting how we do merchant service fees on collection of our billings. Um, curbside recycling is also something that I know Randy's working with you guys on, and we're getting that project moved forward. So a lot of these will come back to you within the next six months or so to talk about and you know we may need to make a shift in the budget for that but we'll address those um, as we get those items resolved. There just wasn't enough information or time to get it into the budget this year. I know there's some discussion about the donations or special appropriations policy and the after budget we'll get together and talk about what are some of those changes that we'd like to see happen there. Um, and then difference in a methodology of distribution of the performance merit pool. Um, Dave is working on that and hopefully we'll have some information for you in the not too distant future. But for now, the, the plan is as it is. Oops. Where did it go? Okay, so just a quick walk through the budget. If you flip to the very first page, you have a table of contents and it pretty much takes you to the different exhibits and subject matters throughout. Um, the budget. One of the biggest differences in the budget presentation this year is that the 2018 uh, draft budget numbers are in the very first column. In the past, they have always been the far column to the right. So, trying to focus left this year, it's a little bit different. Um, the executive summary uh, follows that with the changes and whatnot, and we're going to talk about all of those. It follows the table of contents. And then we have a number of pages that are just the organizational chart, the other boards, commissions, and advisory um, boards. 
And then Exhibit 1, which is on page 31, is a summary of the fund sources and usage, which then is followed by the charts of revenue and expenditures. So this is kind of the chart. These are the numbers that you're always looking for. And hopefully I can read them up here. Um, so 2018, we'll start the year with about a $20 million fund balance. Um, general fund revenues and expenditures will leave an excess in operating of about 3.9, capital acquisitions of a little over 2, and then an excess um, of a little over 1, 8.8, I think that number is. And then we have the support for um, the cemetery, and then the enterprise, stormwater, and governmental capital projects. Those are all the different projects that we have going and that are in the budget. So those are all pretty much capital items with the exception of cemetery where it's some operating support for the cemetery. So in rollover funds, we're looking at about 5.4.5 million. Um, and we're looking at adding some fund balance to assigned reserves like the wastewater treatment plant, parks, the North Christian Park Park and Recreation Development, um, and a lot of our other funds, and they're listed out there in the budget document, and that number we're looking at about 800,000, um, which would leave us with a fund balance at the end of the year of 14.4 million. Um, our re low level required reserve is 35%, which is a little over eight, 11 million, 11.8 11 million. So it puts us right around the 39 to 40% area at the end of the budget um, cycle if we met everything as forecasted. Um, so where does all the money come from? Where are all our revenues? Um, as you can see here, about 21% comes from water and sewer, uh, almost 15% from meals tax, 7% from business and franchise, 9.5% from property taxes, um, and where's the other big one? Uh, 3.1% in state maintenance funds. So that's the majority of where all of our funding comes from. Um, and then where we send it all. About 17% is in public safety. That's police, rescue, fire, uh, and building inspections. Um, public works is about 14 and a half. Uh, water and sewer is about 14%. And those are pretty much the operating budgets with some capital in the public works and public safety. Our major capital projects are pretty much what are consuming about 25% of the budget. Always surprising to me that lodging taxes don't bring in more. I guess that's what it is. Mm -hmm. It's a lot more than it used to be. We keep building more hotels. It's mm -hmm. going up. The park and recreation, uh, that includes the <coughs> it includes PR aquatics. and aquatic it's as well. Aquatics and parks and so recreation. All recreation. Sorry. All recreation. About 8.6%. And that's about 4.4% of our total budget. So, um, after those charts and graphs and summaries, you have Exhibit 2, which is the full detail of all the capital items, cars, trucks, anything large, as well as the capital project budgets. Um, that's followed by a summary of revenues by type, and then the details follow that in Exhibit 4. Exhibit 5 is then the appropriations by each department and program. And if you look at that um, on page 46, you'll see if you look at the very first line, it shows the town council, that detailed budget can then be found on page 53. So between the table of contents and this reference here, it pretty much will get you all the way through the document, anything that you're looking for, you can find there. And then exhibit six is the detail of community support and development on pages 51 and 52. And then exhibit eight is our long-term debt obligations. And then the five-year forecast is found on page 105. So that's just a quick walkthrough of how to get to the budget. So here's some of the highlights. General fund revenues are expected to increase 2.5%. There is no tax increase proposed this year. There is no new debt proposed this year. The water and sewer rates are increased um, and included in this budget as we discussed at the last work session under option 7. Um, suggesting an increase in parking fines from $10 to $25, and an increase in the consumer utility and consumption tax, which would just increase the maximum to $3 from the current $250. Um, there is no change in the rate. It just changes the maximum. 
Ms. Beattie, can I go back since Mr. Sisson's is here? I'll put him on the spot for a second. Mark, do we, uh, the tickets we write, enforcement tickets for parking, what percentage of those are in commercial areas where we're ticketing for handicap or fire lane? A very high percentage of that? I would say 95%. Okay, that's what I thought. I won't go to the other five percent, but that's what I wanted to. I want to. That's what I assumed. Okay, thank you. On the expenditure side, uh, we're looking at about a one point seven percent increase in operating expenditures. There were requests for new staff, um, a total of seventeen, only three of which have been included in this draft, which will bring our full-time staffing employee count to two hundred forty-six. The new positions that we added were one patrol officer, one maintenance worker in public works, and one part-time worker in maintenance worker in parks and recreation that we moved to full-time. Um, he was already working 32 hours a week with medical benefits. So. Um, and then the 2% merit pool is included, a 1% COLA is also included. Um, and then there's about $9.9 .9 million in capital construction projects, 5.5 um, of which are grant funded, a million two is coming from stormwater fees, and the remainder is being supported with town funds or water and sewer revenues um, generated from the rate increase. And with that, I'm going to ask Mr. Wayne to come up and present capital projects. <coughs> started I'm gonna I'm not gonna talk dollars I'm gonna give you a rundown of the projects a brief description I do want to explain that first column is uh, next year's budget FY18 I've shown we have shown FY19 uh, where a project is phased and the last two columns of the town and grant funding for FY18 First project is, uh, which we discussed earlier, Church Creek Biela, storm drain improvements. Uh, that continues the second phase of that project. Hans Meadow drainage improvements, that's in the Hans Meadow subdivision. That initiates design this year and construction next year. Bill Franklin Street drainage improvement, which we just discussed. Engineering is initiated this year and construction next year, if approved. Town Branch Stream Restoration, that's a project that we previously had designed. We had received a grant, SLAF grant from DEQ. We, uh, the, when we bid it, we bid the exceeding available funds. We had to turn the grant money back in when we applied. We just received notification recently that we are slated to be funded this year. This is the one that the aquatics on? Yes, sir. Yeah. Does it include the pedestrian bridge? It does. Okay. It's, well, no. That, that doesn't. That's a separate project. This is the stream restoration itself from uh, the arch culvert at Mill Lane up through the park to Stone Street. But the bridge is on another one, right? Yes. <coughs> Downtown watershed study. Uh, this is also a grant we applied for through the Corps of Engineers. We have not heard from them yet. Uh, certainly, if we don't receive the grant, that that's a 50-50. Uh, 75000 uh, of that is grant money. And I will explain that that studies our downtown area and the drainage coming to downtown and how we may minimize and mitigate some of the flooding that occurs. Next we'll move to transportation projects versus Park Street. That's an ongoing project. These funds will finish the project out after July 1st. Crispin Mill Road, uh, Ray, uh, uh, the rail grade crossing project. That's a HSIP funded project, and we anticipate starting that this year, excuse me, this calendar year. Independence Boulevard, turn lane we just discussed. Huckberry Trail Phase 3, that extends Huckberry from 
food line, essentially, uh, through Oak Tree and the school to Independence Boulevard. We are planning an extension down Independence to, to Gold Leaf, as well as uh, trying to establish a trailhead on Scavenger Drive. Harbor Drive sidewalk, sidewalk improvements along Harbor Drive yeah, from State Electric to the Hardee's, and then uh, that's, that's basically it, um, the scope of the project. Quinn W. Stewart Boulevard signal uh, that provides for the uh, signal at Quinn W. Stewart, as well as we're planning for the eventual construction of the connector road with that. And that's project. hopefully going up at the end of the summer? Pardon me? That, the light is hopefully going up at the end of the summer? It, it'll yeah, begin, the project will begin this fall. Okay. Mr. Nelson, real quickly, the uh, grant funding price there, which is about um, three-fifths of the total, um, that includes any alternative, any and all sources of uh, funding, not just from a from a, a grant, but also from uh, any private as well. Correct. We have we have private funding. And yes, we have received that money. Okay, yes. and so the town commitment of the seven eighty one is the two fifteen. Yes, very good. When, when is it <clears throat> project scheduled to advertisement? And I'm going to write it down. Uh, that it's in. Uh, we're close to the third percent stage of design, so we. I'd have to check the schedule to see where we are, but uh, I can provide you with that information. There's an anticipation of that going to bid sooner than later, though, it sounds like. Yes, we're, we're going to move forward with that project. Be early fall or late fall? Early. 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 When October is early. Mm -hmm. Next project, Ronald Street Sidewalk. Uh, <coughs> sidewalk addition along Roanoke Street from Robert Street to, uh, to the County Government Center. Uh, again, that's designed this year and then construction next, as with Arbor Drive. Capital Paving Program, we have uh, no grant funds to come <coughs> VDOT this year. The North Franklin Cambria Interchange Improvements, uh, this uh, demonstrates the <coughs> design fees uh, for FY18 and then construction uh, dollars for FY19. People Park Trail Extension. This is a new project that we have been notified by VDOT that we are slated to uh, receive funding, uh, transportation alternative funding for this project, provided the Commonwealth Transportation Board approves it and that will extend the trail from from Mill Lane to Depot Park as well as the, the bridge over the creek uh, to connect the aquatic center and, and connect to Kroger as well. Yes, the bridge is part of this. The bridge is yes, yes sir, part of that project. Thank you. One quick question, Mr. Nelson, just about the North Franklin Cambria interchange improvements. That's what we were um, for those now that we were alluding to earlier uh, about the uh, with the independence in Franklin um, uh, construction, that we didn't want that to have any type of interference with that project when it comes due. That's, that's one of the most necessary things in town. Um, everybody hates, frankly, that, that occurred, that set up all of us. Um, but I just, just to be candid, Mr. Nelson, and again, I'm not an engineer, and I don't, I don't claim to be, but when we saw those um, um, options, if you will, um, and the options were graded, and the gradings came back, and I think they did not take into consideration the, uh, the if you will, the um, traffic uh, reduction by virtue of the planned road from Pepper's Ferry over to uh, where Trinity Baptist Church is located. I want to say that the estimated 30% reduction in traffic volume at that intersection. Uh, just speaking candidly, um, I guess I, I came away from that meeting with a sour taste thinking this is the best we could do. Uh, or best that would, could be proposed. Um, uh, is, is that pretty much on the design are we locked in to, we've had all these different options, but is there any other options that may come to light? Um, I just felt like I got rumblings from the, some people in the crowd and myself. I just I kept trying to see that would really work, and I don't know, I guess none of them were just jumping off the page at me. 
certainly some were better than others. <coughs> are, are we pretty much nailed down, if you will, to those options at this point? One of those and that last one we looked at, which would have the ratings of not F, so we would. Correct. Yes, we are. And uh, when we get to the uh, public information uh, design meeting, mm -hmm. uh, we will have a, uh, a simulation yes. of the traffic. I hope that may uh, calm some. Sure. Concern. Well, the reality is you can only do what you can do. I mean, you're and very it's limited. Very, very difficult yes. location. And I made the comment to VDOT, short of this, we need to go to a overpass, and then we're talking big bucks. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. I didn't even get a stop, but I, no. I saw that there. And, yeah. But uh, we are uh, putting ourselves in position even down the road at 2040. If, if we want to make some additional improvements, and involve the railroad, we can also further improve it, but not have to spend the money right now in the time. We're on a, I know, we're on a very tight schedule with VDOT. They're cracking the whip on us, and that's fine. We, sure. we can handle it. But, uh, Thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> um, Park Street. At 105, that's the CTDB contribution that will be applied towards the Park Street sidewalk project. Downtown enhancement funding there to close that project out and uh, pay the contractor any remaining, uh, any remaining funds that he's, he's due. Move to water wastewater. Uh, we have uh, pump station upgrades to Craig Mountain Pump Station and Edgewood Pump Station. And on the wastewater side, we have Call Street Basin I and I and Rehab Phase Two, which we commonly refer to as Phase One and Phase Two. That makes uh, provides for improvements to our sewer system from Crab Creek through town uh, to Hickok and, and on up to uh, towards Call Street. The Montague Street sewer replacement, uh, that's the part of that project when it's bid. Uh, that improves the sewer line on Montague Street. And then finally the Arrowhead uh, sewer study that contract was recently approved by you and, and that will be continuing in FY18. That concludes and if you have any more questions, I can answer them now or at the work session. One last question. The, the $200,000, the railroad crossing project, you don't have to go back to it. Does it you know, <clears throat> um, do we have $200,000 of down funds in that project? Uh, well, it, uh, those those numbers will be updated. Okay. We uh, went to central office and secured more recent funds for us. Okay. So our figures will go down. Okay. The, yeah, the railroad got, charges went up. I, I remember that, but yeah. I was just wondering, that's a big number, to a couple hundred, yes. uh, a couple hundred grand in there for that. And the only reason we're doing that part, <clears throat> it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a worthy project, but the reason it was enticing for us to do is because it was fully funded. And those numbers don't reflect uh, okay. the numbers as, as they will end up being. When we now bring that contract. <coughs> okay. Well, thank you. Well, that's the only thing that stuck out to me. Thank you. Mr. Nelson, not only to that, but what would you, if you had guess, how much would the town be funding for that? Well, if I had to guess, uh, be under 100. High end, under 100, or no? I'll, I'll say high end, 100. You know, I, I swallow hard when I uh, get the numbers from the railroad. But they admit that, uh, fortunately, I think we have a great public works department. They work well with the local uh, railroad crews here and the staff, railroad staff, and that that has a big bearing on, on the amount of money we can save when we can work together as a, as a team. In fact, they've told me that. Thank you. You've got some good projects here, the sidewalk projects, and. Uh, Bring the people park and people in the town are going to recognize and appreciate it.
Thank you. Thank you, Wayne. <coughs> Okay, so some other new initiatives that are in this budget are the design of our wayfinding signs, um, which you approved that contract a few weeks ago, uh, an update to the town website, upgrading and improving our technology background or backbone by upgrading servers, software, data backup and recovery solutions, and IT management systems. There are consultant fees for researching and planning for the new ERP or enterprise uh, resource management, which includes all the financial software as well uh, for that system. Upgrading the phone systems for a police department and wastewater treatment plant. Um, Aquatics has added some after school <coughs> programs. Um, HR has been working on new strong employee safety programs and education and safety um, to improve uh, life for our employees and also to reduce our workers' compensation claims and costs. Um, they're also working on a new orientation program for new employees to improve customer service and employee uh, knowledge. Um, creating ambassadors is kind of what we're calling it. It's educating basically all town employees about what all of the different people within the town do, um, what their work is, so that anytime that they're approached by a citizen that they can be um, knowledgeable about how to refer them, where to refer, refer them, what kind of services that we offer or where they may go to get that. So kind of creating ambassadors, if you'll remember that. And then a um, really big one was the reduced cost of the health insurance, employee premiums, for family coverage. Um, moving to that, uh, it's a high deductible plan. Um, and moving into that, we're going to be kicking off enrollment meetings next month. Um, it takes effect July 1. So we've got a big push going to get that moving forward. Uh, Val, on that note, the health insurance, and you can embarrass me very publicly here if need be. Have we been provided information about what uh, the goal is on those reductions? Because I, I remember some figures we had about what our employees were paying for family coverage and so forth. Mm -hmm. Have we been provided information yet or not? I don't. Randy, can you recall sending to I think we just told you verbally. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Ten, ten 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 remember seeing that real. A little over four hundred dollars towards the family plan monthly. Thank you. Okay. Continue. Sorry. So those are some of the other. And with that, we're gonna. Yeah. Good evening. As Val said, I'm here tonight to present a few key items that are proposed in the public works portion of the town's 2017-2018 budget. The first item is the facility assessment. This is a full assessment of all town facilities and analysis of current conditions of each, including age, design, construction, material, and depreciation. The resulting information will assist in creating preventive maintenance programs, capital improvement and strategic planning initiatives. The assessment will consist of structural components, mechanical systems, energy efficiency, security, heating and air systems, and it also supports destination 2022 goal 3.10, pursue a program of reducing operating costs through more efficient use of energy. And Jim, I was going to ask you, the, uh, the meetings that we had, the two-day retreat, this directly was spoken about, to be proactive and not reactive on um, um, uh, aging and uh, um, capital base that we have and buildings and things of that sort. Is this a direct correlation with that? Yes, it is. Absolutely. This is fantastic. This will allow us to be more proactive Absolutely. in the plan. We had also talked, I think, about even having a, a group of um, public works employees or individuals who would be assigned to basically doing that type of work in a lot of the in-house. I know we're to, this is not what we're doing today, but in the future. But that's something you see with being able to be proactive, that being a necessary component in the years ahead to having sure. people that would be specifically delegated to do those types of uh, internal improvements? Yeah, to a certain extent, as long as it's cost effective for us to do Absolutely. it versus contracting. Absolutely. Okay, our next item is the brush collection service. This service would pro provide an efficient, uh, efficient and effective brush shipping service for the town citizens on a monthly basis. In turn, this service will increase the operational efficiency by reducing the volume a brush collected during the spring and fall cleanup. For this service, we have a one proposed FTE maintenance worker position in the budget. We have the proposed capital equipment purchase of the brush chipper in the budget also. 
along with the the brush chipping, the personnel and equipment will also can support and will support right of way maintenance and trail maintenance operations, concrete maintenance operations, and street maintenance operations. The schedule hasn't been determined yet, has it? What houses will come at what time of the month? Are you doing this? No, no, we haven't laid that out yet. Okay. Our next item is the jet back truck. The primary purpose of this piece of equipment is to improve the efficiency of the sewer collection system by reducing sewer overflows, obstruction, fog removal, and the potential of property damage claims. To date, this fiscal year, we've had 29 overflows, 10 due to obstructions. We've responded to 112 obstructions, and we've had four property claims uh, that resulted in $3,000 payment. This piece of equipment will also support stormwater maintenance and utility locating. It also support, it supports Destination 2022, Goal 2.8, keep the wastewater treatment facility in front of the growth pressures and regulatory uh, mandates. Do you know what is, certainly we're not stupid enough to think we're going to remove fog. What is fog, what is FOG an acronym for? Fat soils and greases. For it's building up in the, in the pipe. <laughs> this truck will give us the ability to go through there and clean those lines and remove it from the manholes before That's it gets to the greases. plant. Makes a lot more sense than the yeah. fog where I can't imagine this fog removal. It's pretty damn powerful. So I fog with fog we get. And there's more to come with the fog. Uh, Ryan's actually drafted and creating the program, and we'll be bringing that forward too. You, you already have a a, a uh, uh, what is it the. Uh, from the uh, companies and like the, like the different uh, restaurants and things like that, you all have a program in place to where you go out and, and monitor that, correct? Yeah, that's correct. Which, which that way it's not finding its way into our system itself, that where there's alternative means of, of I guess, exposing or getting yeah, rid of grease interceptors and so forth. That's right. Mm -hmm. I think you offered a couple of years ago about that. That's a really neat program. Our next item, uh, it also supports Goal 2.8. It's uh, enterprise capital improvement projects that we, uh, we've got placed in the budget. The first one being the system control data acquisition, the SCADA upgrades. This system will allow for the monitoring and control of critical components in the water and wastewater infrastructure. The facilities that will require these updates is the wastewater treatment facility, the wastewater pump stations, and the water distribution system. The second uh, major project that we've got proposed in our budget is the ultraviolet disinfection <coughs> system. The project is designed to upgrade the wastewater treatment plant disinfection system which is currently obsolete. We're running into trouble getting the parts for our current system. And our last is the Town Beautification Program. The Town Beautification Program will focus on designing current and proposed landscape uh, within landscape areas within the right-of-way to complete complement the overall branding identified through the wayfinding sign project. The areas of focus will be the medias, the main street corridor, entryways, facilities, and this also is supported, supporting the Destination 2022 Goal 7.2, establish a beautification project and entry rate program at the interchanges and major, major entry points of the town. In closing, these are only a few areas that I wanted to highlight from the public works portion of the budget. I want to thank you guys for the opportunity to present this information tonight, and I'll be available during work session to answer questions and discuss further. Thank you. Scott, we have two sisters. I'll hand these out, which will probably be best used in the work session. But I guess we'll do that. Okay. Okay. be very brief, but there are a few items that uh, Ms. Twitty has asked me to brief on this evening, and I will be available during work session to elaborate on it. As you recall, in December, I came before Council to present our strategic plan and to also talk about our mythology for strategic planning. Uh, during that briefing, I provided our vision and mission um, under Objective 3.1, which is still a viable strategic planning item within our organization. 
and that objective simply is to obtain authorization to increase the staffing level by three sworn officers, advertise positions, hire and acquire funding to outfit three personnel, and those would be patrol officer positions. Uh, you will see that currently in the graph there is one patrol position listed. That's because two of those have already been removed from the budget, so I'm here to discuss now and in work session the one position that's still in the budget. I did discuss at that time and also in our last budget discussion for last year about the scope of the mission and how the mission has changed due to manpower needs to support the mission expansion of our organization, of our community based on growth in our commercial enterprises, and also in the traveler, travelers and visitors to our community. During the 2016-17 budget, Town Council granted one patrol position um, which was funded and put into place during this current budget year. With that addition, we are three, posi three positions short of our strategic planning goal, which is 2015 to 2018. Also brief then on statistics that I provided la in last year's budget, and that is simply how busy this community is and how busy our patrol officers are. I give just a quick reference by graph to the number of incidents reported to the Virginia State Police each year. I give a reference to communities our size that are local to us, one being Blacksburg and one being Salem Police, uh, that we have less sworn officers but respond and report more incidents than those jurisdictions. The why, second, why, is, why is that, Chief? I'm sorry, go back to that. You pulled out, you know, I'm always, I think all of us are, can, you know, can find statistics that say what we want to, want to say, and, and my trust level with you is very high, you know, but why is that? Is that, I mean, are we, are, are people uh, ornery are here, or is it the way that these data are, are reported, or? What's your assessment of that, honestly, as far as is why? It yes. Honestly, the reporting mechanism is similar. Uh, we are mandated by state police to report uh, every criminal incident, so the, re the numbers are solid from and every jurisdiction. If they are from Christiansburg, correct. Does that mean they're, would, would you also say that those are reliable from our neighboring communities? I, as well? I would say yes, because they're mandated reported items. Okay. Uh, I would say that our jurisdiction with the amount of retail and the daylight traffic that we encounter, uh, it's a very busy, it's a very busy atmosphere, especially during the daytime hour. Um, I do have statistics that I can provide on fraud, embezzlement, <coughs> shoplifting, some of the retail crimes that we deal with that some of our other jurisdictions do not. Okay. Thank you. The second item that I know that we will discuss, and I think there's already been discussion about that in previous work session. Uh, is the five patrol vehicles that I've asked to replace. Uh, in the past 10 years that I've been the police chief, I have requested four patrol vehicles every year. Uh, this year I requested five just because of the vehicle rotation plan that uh, we done earlier in the year uh, from town administration. Our goal was to replace vehicles uh, when they reached 125,000 miles. These five vehicles that I'm requesting to replace are patrol vehicles, and you will see that they range from 2003, 2006, and 2007 uh, with at least 125,000 miles on those vehicles other than vehicle 703, which we need to replace because it has major, major electrical and uh, other damage that is not productive. Is that consistent with neighboring localities? Or uh, One statement I made is in <clears throat> in our work session is, I think it's real important that we look and, and act like our, the community we serve. <clears throat> we serve a conservative community. And I just, uh, since you weren't at the last meeting, that's that's been, a, you know, something that we talked about was looking and acting like the community we serve, which is conservative. Yes, sir, I agree. And so with that, those numbers, cars are changing. And again, my trust level with you is high. But is that is that about what other localities are doing? as far as rotation policy goes. Are we, are we acting like, you know? I would say yes, if not a little more conservative. Is that right? Yes. Okay. You would take, I mean, for example, you take vehicle 701, which is a patrol vehicle, uh, <clears throat> an everyday operation patrol vehicle. 
that's 10 years old and 157,000 miles. You will see in the packet that I provided, I have provided maintenance costs for each of the five vehicles that we are asking to replace, and you will see that there are um, maintenance issues and numbers that are starting to catch up on these older vehicles. Our plan before was to replace vehicles at eight years. You know, if you recall five years ago, five and six years ago, uh, we replaced no patrol vehicles. Uh, that got us to a point now where we're in the 150,000 mile range with some of these vehicles. And I really, I firmly believe that we've got to get at least these five out of the fleet to move forward and be consistent. With, with the plan of trying to rotate out of 125,000. I mean, the numbers really are, are relatively low, and I guess you're saying they're low, but the, it's a stop and go going that the, these vehicles have to go through all the time. That's why they get not torn up, but that's why the maintenance is so high. Is that right? Correct. These are not highway miles. These are stop and go miles. 157,000 miles on a patrol vehicle, in my opinion, is 300,000 on a normal vehicle. <coughs> that's, there's, those are really tough miles that, that's been put on this <coughs> Okay, one last question. Yes, sir. And since we're having this, and, and, and this will go a long way towards settling myself on, on this, but is our ratio of cars per personnel in line with other localities that are nearby? I'd say they're consistent. I mean, there's some agencies that very similar. Having, You're saying they're very they're similar. Having a different fleet system. Uh, some have more vehicles than us, and some have less. And I can also provide those numbers. No, I'm trusted. You know, I'm, these are some blunt questions, mm -hmm. but uh, the ratio of vehicles <clears throat> to uniformed officers. You're saying is very similar to our neighboring localities. I think they're very similar, but I would have to address those agencies and pull their numbers because I can't speak specifically to what their fleet numbers are, but I'd be happy to do that for council. And Chief, since we've, we've opened this subject, I figure we've put some of this in work session, but just I may ask you, since you just commented on it, um, the vehicles that have been in the budget, which remain in the budget from what I've seen thus far, I think I saw four, maybe it's five in there. No, there's four. No, there's, there's four. Requests for five. Right, there's four in the budget. Um, the, the initial request was for five, correct? Correct. The budget, four found their way into the budget. The initial request for the patrol was three. One found their way into the budget. Does that change at all? I, mean, that's, I take it that will be separate from the vehicle rotation plan, correct? That's correct. It doesn't really have any correlation between the two. Does that numbers have no correlation to the number of vehicles in the fleet. Okay, and, and as far as... Um, Vehicles assigned to an individual patrol officer. Obviously, there's a rotation, yes, but is there a, a vehicles assigned to each, each particular officer in general? Or? We, we do have some fleet vehicles that are dual, uh, dual purpose. Mm -hmm. for, for example, daylight shift is assigned to one officer, and midnight shift is assigned to the other officer coming in. There are individually assigned vehicles to personnel, uh, for example, tactical, tactical team members, supervisors, and I have provided information. Uh, in your packet to show you our every vehicle and every vehicle's destination, whether it's a take-home vehicle, the number of take-home vehicles, because I knew that would be <coughs> discussed in work session. I want you to have that, and I can answer those questions. But in the last question I've got, the, the um, with the rotation, the, again, our rotation policy, where we have, obviously our vehicles exceed the amount of people we have on the, on the floors because we have to have vehicles to, to rotate. Um, are those utilized when, I guess, the individual's main vehicle is in the shop or being maintained or being serviced or something along those lines? Correct. We have two spare patrol vehicles, and those two spares are utilized when vehicles are out of service. Uh, and the, the, none of these are the spares at this point? No, they are not spares. Those are active vehicles. Those are active. Correct. All right. Um, 031 was, uh, I guess since now I have four left in the budget in my pile, 031 is a Tahoe that was driven by Major Reed, who's retiring, so that's one of the vehicles I was going to phase out. 602, 701, 703, and 704 are fleet police vehicles that are on the street, black and white police cruisers. So I think I'll probably end up keeping 031 and I'll replacing the patrol vehicles at this point. Your, your case is a lot stronger with you present than when you're not present. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I said is it the gun or the taser? I'm sorry. I'm just... <laughs> we do our own maintenance? No, we do not. We do not have a PSA department. No, who, who does most of our maintenance? We use local vendors in the community to do maintenance. 
I think it's uh, I provided in your packet just a few things, uh, a justification statement for the police vehicles that we're purchasing, a request for capital acquisition form, which gives you general information on the vehicles we're replacing, and also the reason why we're replacing those vehicles, a maintenance summary sheet for each of the five vehicles that we're requesting to replace, our take-home vehicle policy that was implemented in August of 2012, and a take-home vehicle, a list of every take-home vehicle, which um, you know, we've had this discussion, we had it last year. Uh, Council, we have to be, I'm happy to report that when we implemented the policy in 2012, we had 12 vehicles outside of Montgomery County. Currently, with, through attrition, as we knew would happen, we have six going outside, and those are essential vehicles to police operation. Uh, what happens with these automobiles when you get rid of them? Sir? Uh, what happens uh, uh, with these automobiles? Well, most of the patrol vehicles are in such bad shape. Um, we, we do sell those, and the money comes back into general fund all of a sudden. Uh, normally, on a police vehicle with 157,000 miles, we make it 2,000, 3,000 if we're lucky. Okay, thanks. talk a little bit about our FY18 program. Um, at the very end, I'm going to go through a couple of the items that are in, in the capital budget request. But really what I kind of want to do is uh, talk to you about the initiatives we have and some programs we have going and how we're going to spend the money uh, that you have so graciously given us in the past and hope we'll continue this year. General fund budget request, as you're aware, is, is relatively flat. We, we try to be very lean, good stewards of money there. So the general fund request is very flat. Our focus as an agency <coughs> Primary focus, excellence in patient care. Um, if you think about EMS, EMS is evolving at a very rapid pace. EMS, the way I experienced it 10 years ago, is very different now. And certainly from the way it was when I started as a, a much younger man 30 years ago, uh, we've seen incredible changes. It, it's evolving at a, such a rapid pace. Uh, the National EMS Management Association actually takes the position that we should change the name from EMS the paramedicine uh, as a discipline to recognize the complexity and the professionalism that are necessary to deliver this service. Um, it also reflects that you know over the last several years there's been a diminished emphasis on EMS or rescue or paramedicine as simply a transport system, but rather we have become an integrated partner in a healthcare delivery system that causes increases in patient outcomes, positive increases from the minute we make contact with the patient. So we become integrated partners uh, in healthcare. And at Christian Bird Rescue, we embrace that vision. That is our mission, to become integrated partners and deliver excellent patient care starting when we arrive on scene. So some initiatives, some things that uh, have happened in years past and are going to continue. Um, I was a little worried about putting the slide up here because I didn't get Melissa's permission, but since the town manager has already, already mentioned it, I, I feel pretty safe. We are actually very proud. We just got awarded this. Uh, the, the AHA's meeting uh, was held in Lynchburg a couple days ago, and we have received the highest award from the AHA for uh, heart care. This is the EMS Mission Lifeline Gold Plus Award, and uh, I think only three in the state have gotten this. I think Salem, I may misspeak, so I don't want to put in Abingdon and us, are the only three that got the Gold Plus Award this year. Um, and this is in recognition of our emphasis on getting patients who are having heart attacks, people whose heart are starving for blood. We get them to a cath lab in a very timely manner, and we do it on a repetitive basis. Um, we had some of the best times in the state. This involves an internal focus with our members, getting them to do the right things. It involves having the right equipment. Um, it involves having the scheduling and things deployed correctly. And it involves working with the hospitals to get the patients to the cath lab quickly. So we're very, very proud of this award. Now, I've got to stop talking because Melissa's going to do some press releases on this, and I don't want to steal the thunder. But we're very, very proud of this. Mr. Cole, uh, Chief Cole, well, one question real quick, though. Um, the commitment to you through the use of the revenue recovery funds to outfit the uh, police cruisers yes. with the 
I take it that would also play a role into this as well. It's a community commitment. Yep, absolutely. And, and actually more so in the second half. Now, the first half is the heart attacks where they're still alive. Yes. The second half, and I'm going to talk about that right now, so thank you for that. I mean, yeah, yeah, <laughs> uh, cardiac arrest survival. So as you're aware, um, we leverage those funds, and we did put AEDs in every patrol car, and it is the norm now to go to a subject unresponsive call and have one or two police officers inside who have already deployed their AED and the first aid kits that we've helped them assemble. So it's a fantastic partnership um, between the agencies. Mm -hmm. Second thing I really want to talk about, so since I came on board, we've had a focus with helping people who have out-of-hospital cardiac arrest survive. One of the big changes that we made, and this happened several years ago, was we started working them on scene. So if you or your loved one goes into cardiac arrest, your heart stops beating, and we show <laughs> up, we are not going to scoop you up really fast and take you to the ER. Why not? Because that's not how you save lives when people are having cardiac arrest. The mission of EMS, that integrated partner, is to take the resources to the scene and save that person right there. So we, you know, this wasn't an original idea with me, I wish I could say that, but we copied the systems that are really high performing. King County, Washington, Wake down in North Carolina. We said, what are you folks doing to save your incredible save rates? These are the things they're doing. So we started working cardiac arrest on scene. We've been doing that for several years. We added in the AEDs to all the patrol cars, which has really helped. The thing that has come about this last year, and we're going to be building on in FY18, is something we call our code teams. And this is part of our outreach to the community. If you think about the ramifications of working a cardiac arrest on scene, you now have a whole other group of patients. And that's the family or friends of that person who's lying there on the floor having CPR done to them. So we actually have a group of counselors, ministers, uh, some are life members in the agency who no longer run calls. They actually respond to the scene and take over kind of the emotional and spiritual support for the family, for the providers, and they provide an invaluable service. Recently we had a, a pretty tragic event out of hospital. I can't violate confidentiality to go into details, but the family member of one of the patients, the patient was a student at Virginia Tech. So our code team actually put the family in their Tahoe, drove them to Virginia Tech, got the girl rather than telling her by phone and took her to the hospital with them, um, and they had expired. But heart, heart attack is the number one killer, isn't it? It's actually number two. We're go that's a good lead in, too, because we're going to talk about the other one here in just a second, but it's really, really hot. And so we really want to make sure we decrease the incident of heart attack becoming cardiac arrest. So I want to get into the cath lab really quick. The next thing, and this actually is one of the items that's specifically in the budget. There was one in the budget last year, there's one in the budget this year. Pre-hospital ultrasound. Um, we engage in very cutting-edge medicine at Christiansburg Rescue. We research the things that will help us take the best care of people that live, work, and play in Christiansburg. <coughs> they deserve it, they expect it, and that's what we want to deliver. So pre-hospital ultrasound has numerous benefits, um, and there's also going to be some releases on this, so I won't talk too much tonight in the labor, but trauma patients, helping us determine which location they will go to if they're in a, in a traumatic incident. Medical patients, there's a lot of medical uses pre-hospital for ultrasound. It's a very specialized skill, uh, requires extra training, and only the paramedics amongst our groups are allowed to do this. But we're really excited uh, to bring some board. We're the first agency in this area to do ultrasound. But it is, it is something that is coming nationwide. A big initiative that we started several years ago, um, one of our college students brought this to my attention that there was a need we could fill. We actually have been pushing the sepsis alert program in this valley. Um, you mentioned heart attacks being killers, cardiac arrest. Sepsis is actually a bigger killer of patients than those cardiac events. But it's not as, uh, it doesn't have the mystique, you know, so it doesn't get the publicity. Sepsis is a systemic response by the body to overwhelming infection. It is lethal and it kills people and the findings to determine somebody is septic are often subtle. So we have instituted a program, the sepsis alert program, we actually draw a lactic acid on patients. Now that's a, a blood test, um, and one, one of two agencies in Virginia that do that. We kept pushing the data to the hospitals and pushing and pushing, and finally they said, you know, there's something here. And so now with one of the two local hospitals, we have demonstrated that we are greatly reducing the time of the patient from our contact to them being in a critical care unit where they're getting the care they need to fix the sepsis. It's critically, critically, critically helping those patients. So the sepsis work program will continue on uh, in this fiscal year. A little bit about who we are. Um, we have 81 volunteer members, and there's a spreadsheet. I think we'll talk about some analysis during the work session portion. Um, we have 10 staff. 
And, um, you know, we're really a hybrid volunteer staff municipal EMS agency. When we talk about the evolution of EMS, you know, we are still a rescue squad. We're still very much a second family as a group. But we're a very professional, forward-leaning, progressive EMS agency. So a little bit about the call volumes. And the Chief Assistant also already mentioned that uh, there's increasing demands for service on public safety. EMS rescue is not immune to this at all. If you go back, this is calendar years. This was uh, calendar year 15. We were at about 4,000 calls. These are all within you know, 100 or so. In calendar year 16, we had jumped 10% to 4,400. And based on where we are as of year to date, we anticipate for calendar year 17, we may hit 4,800 calls. If I took you back several more years, that trend has increased. So there is an increasing demand on our services. And what we're seeing is that we're transporting incredibly sick patients. Well, why is that, Joe? Is um, that your professional <coughs> assessment of why it's going up to I think part of it, aging the population. Um, access to health care, there, there's a lot of big megatrend reasons why that could be. Um, and I think it's just because of the, the prevalence of people coming through the area during the daylight. Our call volume actually, the, the spike actually occurs during the daylight hours. That's 10% a year. That's tremendous growth. Yep. We're hoping, <laughs> we're hoping that this is kind of a terminus here and it doesn't continue past that. But this is where we're on track right now for calendar year 17. And, and you, for a while you were having trouble people calling you because they had a cut or, or some little thing like that. Most of these are legitimate. Yeah, sure. um, every EMS system is, is going to have folks that, that use you because they have no other way to get to the ER. So uh, we recognize that. Most of these are, are legitimate, I hate to use that term, legitimate medical emergencies that require our, our intervention. Joe, the majority of those calls are, are they're occurring during the six to six hours again? Yeah, I, I, the breakdown, I, I don't have the most recent for May, mm -hmm. but we run about 60% of our calls on daylight hours and about 40% at night time. Yeah, if you use the six to six <laughs> hours. You only find night time at six, night till six in the morning. Yes, okay. Chief, would you, would you contribute to those numbers? I know that these are just recent numbers. Sure. Just the avail availability of staff. Yes. Because I mean, years ago, yeah. I mean, we I would say prior to 2015, we we weren't even close to even answering 4,000 calls. Well, yeah, that's correct. Um, so in 2011, you know, we we were coming under that strain as a lot of agencies were to cover daylight calls, and so end of 2011, early 2012, we made a lot of strategic changes. Mm -hmm to help make sure that we recover the call. So I, I think, you know, from 2012 forward, we're also seeing the effect of not turning over a lot of calls to other agencies. So we're covering our own calls. Right. Thank you. Um, so future projections, um, is, you know, again, we can go by our strategic plan. You know, we anticipate that increasing call volume. Um, I, I hope that it's going to kind of level out with this year, and we'll see that the next several years stick around that level. Um, the increasing complexity of EMS certification and EMS in general, I already alluded to, we are transitioning, because the state is transitioning, away from four levels of EMS certification. Right now, we have the benefit of kind of a mid-level provider called the EMT Intermediate, who can do almost everything that a paramedic can, but they're not a paramedic. A lot less hours training, lots less expense training. That certification is being phased out. It's a curriculum that's 19 years old. It's not supported anymore. It's being phased out. The curriculum that replaces it cuts out a lot of the heart care stuff. So what we will end up having to do, the AMT is the new level, um, that will be our default level. We'll have to get people to the paramedic level, which is a little more complex than getting into intermediate. So as we plan strategically, we've got to figure out how we're going to deliver paramedic level care absent the intermediate uh, certified folks. Um, increasing staff needs, as, as we looked at our strategic plan, um, we know that we're going to have to kind of change the model for our staffing. Right now we, use, we depend on flex time staffing and, and quite literally what we have is leftover availability. Um, most of our, our staff members work full-time for another system, uh, and so they have certain days that they're off in any given month, and that may or may not match what we need to cover the holes in their schedule. So um, changing away from that model to people whose schedules we can control is, is very important. And as the agency starts to accumulate up towards 4,800 calls, we recognize that we're going to have to have some additional structure in place to replicate need. Um, you know, I need some depth at the bench uh, to help us evenings, weekends, times where we're kind of absent with staff supervision. Oops. Um, some specific items that are in the budget, and we can talk more about these during the, the work session. You know, we're asking for a, a camera system for our station. We have narcotics at our station. 
uh, and, and to protect the people that are there 24 hours a day, um, it's kind of a needed upgrade. We don't have enough cameras in our system to capture all of the entrances, all the hallways, and most importantly, all of the sides of the ambulances where we store all the narcotics. They're very important. Um, the ultrasound device uh, is, is in the budget. We're asking for one ambulance, and needs to kind of revenue recovery. Uh, we have an ambulance that's, that's kind of reaching its, the end of its safe life and needs to be replaced, and it's on the rotation plan. Um, we are continuing the radio system backbone project that's been going on now for a while. Um, we've, we've actually bought most of the equipment for it in this fiscal year. We're going to start doing the, the install and things in FY18. Uh, we're asking for one stretcher, which is rather expensive, about $17,000. And uh, we need to replace our ATV. It's about 17 years old and is becoming obsolete. Joe, the, um, and the page four of the budget, uh, it has that we have a rescue truck reserve. Yes. And, and that, that is EMS rescue truck reserve. Correct. That's correct. what yes. And uh, I, I noted that yes. estimated as of June 30th, provided we put 25 in this year, which is what's allocated currently, we're going to be at 118. Give us an idea as to what the, uh, talk about a rescue type vehicle. And then granted there's more than one. Sure. The one you're referring to that's in the budget, what's the cost of that? So an ambulance, uh, the, the type of ambulance that we use in this area, it's a, it's a, a truck front end for the box, full drive, including the, the stretcher mount, the power load system that we use, $200,000 to $225,000. Okay, so, very, so, very expensive piece so us putting 25000 into the budget each year towards went 10 years before we can frankly afford one, of course, right, just for inflation, about 11 years. Correct. And so um, with the revenue recovery funds, I mean, granted, that's that's one way to, of course, allocate, sure. realize that. Um, Val, that's, that 25 of those come out of general fund, correct? Mm -hmm. okay. That's a general fund. Correct. Okay. Uh, is, it, is it the EMS or the, uh, the the fire that gets county funds as well? Both. Both. Okay. Four vehicles, right? Yeah, we, we get a, a county allocation, which is a... A, a smaller percent of our budget by far than what the town provides, mm -hmm. um, and we use it to offset uniforms, training, and we are on a county vehicle rotation, so they come not very frequently, but we are on a county vehicle rotation. Do they own some of some of the vehicles county owned or county purchased that you're currently utilizing? Yes, sir. I was thinking they were. Yeah. I've noticed one thing. I appreciate the mutual aid reports that we get. Sure. I think I don't want to go too far down this rabbit hole, but. The, it, it does appear to a layman that uh, we do tend to answer a lot of calls in the county, a, a good portion. Um, but in addition, I, as far as mutual aid, it seems like we are very uh, entrenched in providing that mutual aid, which we should be. That's, that's a required responsibility that we have. But it, it, uh, one thing that has concerned me going forward a little bit, and you've been commenting on this through some emails and things, would be that uh, I hope that we have a reciprocated type of um, attitude, if you will. Uh, and I'm sure we probably do. Oh, we do. Maybe that's why the resources, yeah, but um, absolutely. it just seems that we answer a lot more calls than um, than uh, we have answered for us. Perhaps we're, we're, a donor. Right. we're, we're a donor. probably a donor. We're a donor. That's right. We're yeah. a donor. We, I mean, we have really strong partnerships with the other. Agencies. Absolutely, they're, they're great folks. Um, but it, it's a resource availability issue. Um, <clears> they do help us out when we get in a pinch, but we are usually the net provider, especially during the daylight. Daylight tends to be uh, countywide when there's an issue. But that was our basic for the. Uh, Revenue recovery was that stacked call issue yes. that we knew we were getting, and we 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 recognized it five years ago, four yep. years ago. I mean, when you've got less than four thousand calls, and Absolutely. now we're forty-eight, obviously. Mm -hmm. okay. <coughs> that truck that you had that light to replace, you have uh, any idea of what kind of mileage it has? I think it currently has about one hundred and twelve thousand. I didn't check it today. I think it's about one hundred twelve thousand, and it takes about ten months from the time the budget gets approved. So we can't cut the PR to do the order. So it's about a year from the time. So it'll have another year's worth of mileage. It'll, it'll be in the 120s, which for an ambulance, the way we drive them is really high. Absolutely. Joe, one final thought. That award that you all received. Yes. Um, again, going back to revenue recovery, the whole purpose was not to replace that general fund. Again, as long as I ever sit here, but I'm never going to look to replace that general fund with that requirement. I, don't, I think that would be a, a misstatement we would have made at the town citizens. But the reality is we talked about enhancement. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think, but would you not say that's a direct correlation with oh, receiving that and our enhanced oh, level of service that we can provide now that we have that? Oh, yeah. With, with the equipment we've been able to buy through absolutely. the recovery, the, the ability of having hiring on part time paramedics, it's phenomenal what we've been able to enhance in terms of service. Absolutely. Very good. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you.
session. I think we just did have a work session. I think we're having a work session. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think we already had a work session. Right. Um, so anyway, to finish up, just five-year forecast, I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about what some of the assumptions were in the five-year forecast and presenting it. Um, it includes moderate growth and inflation in all years of about 2% and potentially a small tax increase in 2021 um, to help fund some aging infrastructure. The proposed water and sewer increase that is uh, included for 2018, and as well as the forecast that we had with that rate study going forward into the 19, 20, 21, and 22. Um, programmed growth and expansion of services are not really forecast into it. It's existing services. Uh, one of the things that we did not incorporate it at this time because we didn't feel we had enough information in, about phasing and design is the North Christians Park Park. However, we have added um, a, a fairly decent chunk to the reserve funds again in this year's budget to help fund that project. If we come up with plans later in the year, either we can go to that or we can go to some other resources to um, fund anything that we might put in there. But that is not included in the forecast at this time. Um, it also assumes that we'll continue to receive grants and capital funding for a number of streets, trails, and stormwater projects, and that we'll continue to set funds aside for specific projects. Those are the designated assigned reserves that we um, have been doing every year, and that we will need to incur debt um, to fund some of the capital water and sewer projects uh, around 2021 20, and 2022. But that would be somewhat minimize obviously by the well the, the goal would be as we go through the project is it, zero the different projects that we can reduce that debt factor down um, through building up some reserves and some other things that would be for, the objective for the, that was how it was built for the assumes it's a uh, feel good assumes not a we're not sure what no, I no. Those are no. They're based on what we've been doing in the past and what a real expectation is that we'll continue to do that. But it would be unfair of me to say that we're going to do it all with general fund dollars right. <laughs> if we don't have some of the grants and if we don't plan um, and set some reserves aside. Yeah, things aren't going to work out quite the way we plan. Well, Mr. Quiz, since we're on the on the topic of reserves, I'm just looking at page four. Uh, real quick question: the uh, treatment plant reserve, which is. Yeah. This makes me feel better or as good about the budget as anything else. The fact that we put these monies aside. And that way we and it's not a rainy day. It's it's knowing that in the future we're gonna have to use these monies to remediate and to uh, and to refurbish. But the treatment plant reserve is estimated at two hundred thousand dollars to be added this fiscal year. It says the estimated funds as of June thirtieth at one fifty. Is that a typo? It's supposed to be three fifty perhaps. Yeah, that would be at June 30, that's at 6 30, 2017. Yes. That's not plus. No, that, that's, it's a, it's treatment plan reserve of 200,000 to be added, but it listed, it's estimated in the fund at only 150. Right, because I think we only put 50 in it last year. Should, 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 should it be 250 then? I'm just trying to. It would be, it would be 350 then. That's not Yeah. So it's to put 200 in it. There's 150 in it now. So this is what's so it would be so at 350, 350. As of June 3rd of 2018. Yes. Got it. Next, next year when we look at this, 350. And actually, if you look in the, um, the capital outlay exhibit, it has another little chart of all of those reserves in it, and it also has the forecast for what we, with the reserves that we're adding, what it would be in 2018. At the end of 2018. And so we actually more helpful. absolutely, and, and so we actually are adding these to our reserves the very last day of the, if you will, fiscal year. Correct. Uh, I usually put them in mid-year sometime. Um, one of them was a new fund this year, so it's getting mm -hmm. done a little bit later in the year. But most of them I put in three or four months in the year, so they're accruing interest throughout the year. And very good. So with that. Wow. Yeah. Could very well be. Any other questions? I'm, I'm disappointed that we're not able to do one with the, the new park. I will say, again, just a sidebar comment has nothing to do with dollars, but I'm tired of hearing North Regional, North Christopher Regional Park. I just essentially call it the new park for now until we decide what we want to call it. But anyway, um, I'm going to ask the chief uh, to, if 
see if you learn of any new information other than what you said tonight, because we've got a lot more detail on some things that that we have been discussing. This is just me talking. But if those two those two items, the vehicle ratio per uniformed officer, if there's anything different than what you said that is very similar, then I'm going to accept that. And the other one is the uh, our vehicle rotation policy. That that's not unre It's not. That is consistent with, you know, neighboring localities, and and really, it goes to the point that we, you know, of looking and acting like the community we serve, which is being conservative and frugal with our resources. So I ask you to correct if, if you if you have anything to add to that. that's different. I would love to appreciate hearing that. So. Very good. Let me ask about the uh, ambulance. Joe, uh, so you, you indicated that it would be almost a year before, let's say if we approved it now, it would be a year before it would arrive here? Yes, sir. The, the factory usually takes between eight and ten months from the time we put the order in, so we couldn't put the order in legally until you know, July 1, so um, it would be eight to ten months after that. Why does, that's pretty standard. why does it take that long? That, that's all it takes to build an ambulance. They build them all um, to order. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, we, we buy off a, a contract, uh, a Roanoke County procured contract, I'm sorry, Montgomery County procured contract. Okay, thank you. Uh, council reports. Uh, Mr. Hubbard. Well, I would just say that the uh, Montgomery Museum, <coughs> we had our cruising car thing uh, this past weekend, and they had um, 75 cars there. And uh, they went over uh, uh, pretty well. And um, so uh, Montgomery Museum just wanted to make sure that they, you know, they are, you know, trying to uh, do activities here in downtown Christiansburg. And, and the next thing that's coming up is uh, the Mountains of Music. Mm -hmm. That's all I have, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Shovel. I have nothing to report. Mr. Stipes? I have nothing to report. Thank you, Mayor. Mr. Howell? Nothing to report. Mr. Uh, Bishop. Thank you. We're <laughs> 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 saving turn. ourselves. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'd like to have uh, make a request that during one of our work sessions, that we make a some time to discuss and review the insurance requirements for the vendors at the farmers market. Oh yeah, that's, that's right. Good. Yeah, I about that last week. Do you think they're too great or not great enough? Well, that's why I want to. Discuss. We all went through all of that. But anyway, that's fine. We can do that. Thank you. Uh, is that anything else? No. Can I, would that be something that can go to the farmer's market? I don't, committee? I don't know if they're meeting very often right now, Mr. Showalter. Well, Mayor Barber's. I think the last time they met it was just Sarah and Mr. Wingfield, I thought. Mm -hmm. And Melissa. Thank you. Unless I'm sorry. Well, I'll make a request because I have to educate myself. That's a good idea. Thank you. Mr. Collins? Okay. Very good. Uh, I will, the only thing I'll really report on is uh, the Wine and Artisan Festival downtown last Friday night, the DC I put on. It was a really good event. I don't know whether any of you had a chance to get down. I did see four or five of our town staff members down there and, and got a good vibe. It was uh, well attended, well received. The food trucks both uh, reported they did very well. Uh, and it's hard to. It, the crowd stayed consistent in numbers, but not in the people. Though. We didn't have any bar flies hanging around all night. We had people coming in and coming out all night. It went very well, and I, I, I have gotten a lot of, of good comments and good compliments from uh, citizens wanting to do it, wanting them to do it more often. But and Mayor, no, no negative yeah. incidents reported at all, was there? Oh, no. No, whatsoever. Good. The only thing that they did, some, one of the suggestions was that we may need to, and we can work this through Parks and Rec maybe, is that they thought if there were some more tables for, for dining, uh, people could sit and enjoy the meal and enjoy the movie more. There was or the music. There was there was a few tables, but a lot of people sat in the grass. It was it's kind of a nice little streetsy festival. <clears throat> Any other business to come before council? Uh, one last last. This is. Uh, are we going? Are we still have more access yes. on the budgets? Yes. Okay. Forget it. Go proceed with adjournment. Sorry. Okay. I, we we will uh, adjourn. We'll take about a three or four minute break.
to uh, before I uh, call the work session into order. Uh,